And that concludes our press conference. We certainly like to welcome you to the Gateway Open Studios Tour uh, 2020, our 17th celebration. We invite you to visit us on YouTube. We're, we're live. So if you can play this in your, in your living rooms today, we certainly hope that you'll do that. Share with all your friends. Thank you to all of the participants here and all of our partners. We wish you a very, very blessed day. Hi everyone, my name is Gary Coltrane. I'm a visual artist, also an instructor. And as a backdrop, you see the mural. My daughter, niece, and a former student created. It took us about three and a half, four months. And in lieu of the shutdown, this was pretty much made on behalf of those in this building, a building dedicated solely for arts. But the literary, visual, performing, and the, the culinary arts showcase. These are actual images of people with whom live in the building. Also, there's a piece I created. It's a relief of uh, Dr. Dorothy Height. Go forth, my child. And I want to leave that message with everyone with whom's in the arts. Continually go forth, despite the uh, shutdown. This is the time for those within the arts to shine. Thank you. Tell me. 
parents always told me life can be hard and that things don't always go the way we plan. My parents told me something else, that a life without inspiration Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers is not any worth living. And since I've lost it, my inspiration, I've come back home to do what has to be done. <laughs> reality is that America is not God, America is not the end of the earth, and it doesn't matter what the Americans think, in the final analysis, the truth will come out. Can you show me the doll that you like best or that you'd like to play with?
I'm Sherry Lumpkin, founder and executive director of the Rag Baby Exchange. The mission of the Rag Baby Exchange is to inspire participants to embrace the inner love for themselves and others through doll making. Our approach celebrates both the differences and similarities of diverse peoples and cultures. We strongly promote the idea of giving, which we believe creates a twofold effect empowerment enjoyed by the giver and the energy of love and compassion felt by the receiver. I used to do doll making, teach doll making to kids at a museum and when I taught them how to make dolls I noticed that a lot of the kids really wanted to make the dolls look like something on television, something other than themselves and so I started talking to them and I asked them if I could help them make the doll look like them. The Rag Baby Exchange is a workshop using doll making to build self-esteem and self-love in women and children. We create an atmosphere of peace in our workshops through a process of discovering one's self-esteem. The Rag Baby <clears throat> Exchange workshops bring about a sense of acceptance, self-affirmation, forgiveness and peace within individuals and our communities. During the doll making we use journals, we blow bubbles, we release all kinds of negative thoughts and self-talk and we replace them with affirmations and love. We write love letters to ourselves. All of this is done so that once your doll is completed, you have the energy of love within your doll. When you leave, you have this beautiful representation of yourself, your own self-image, and it is beautiful. Now I'm fully grown And I'm seeing everything clearer Just sweep away that does from the mirror Okay, speakers. Okay, let me unmute again. Okay, can everybody hear me? I hope so. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Rachel Ann Cross, and I'm really happy to be part of this studio tour today. Um, I want round of applause for all who put this incredible thing together. Um, what an amazing feat of technology and communication and the arts and everything else. So uh, anyway, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Rachel N. Cross, and um, I like to use a lot of repurposed materials with my art. I think it's good for the world. It makes us look at artwork in a different way. And um, art is how artists make sense of the world. So there is a lot of art being made right now because we're all trying to make um, sense of the world and <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that we're trying to figure out um so uh let me show you a little bit about what i do um i use a lot of uh scraps of plywood i use a lot of repurposed materials um like broken jewelry and i take apart musical instruments things like that so um let me start with <laughs> one of my pieces here uh to show you so um this is a hand of hope that I'm holding up here. Uh, it's beaded, it's on wood, it's got gold leaf, acrylic paint. Um, and I've been thinking about the human hand a lot, right? Because touch has become something that could actually be fatal 
uh, or can make you very ill. So the human hand and our healing touch um, is something we're, we, we're having to do remotely, which is an insane thing to think about. But I'm, I'm thinking about all those who are helping and healing the world. In whatever way you do that, I'm thinking about you. <laughs> so I've been making a, a series of these, these hands, healing and helping hands. Uh, and we all heal and, and in our own ways, and we're all finding the, the passion and inspiration to get through these times. Um, and one of the places I go to very often is nature. <laughs> um, people don't always associate, you know, Prince George's County with natural beauty, but there is so, there is so much here. Anacostia Watershed Society um, really is a wonderful organization that helps to uh, spotlight that. But they're even walking around your neighborhood, you're gonna see a lot of animals. Um, so I've started a series of Maryland wildlife uh, works. Um, and this is one called Clever Girl. <laughs> I see foxes a lot. I'm out late at night with my dog and we see a lot of foxes. And um, I think it's a gift every time an animal uh, reveals itself to us. And I think our relationship with nature is a sacred thing. So um, besides using my repurposed materials, broken jewelry and things like that, um, I use gold leaf on my paintings. Um, you often find it in, you know, iconography, sacred objects, um, in temples and churches and synagogues and other houses of worship. So I like to, to use the gold leaf to show that this connection we have with nature is a very um, sacred and, and beautiful thing. <laughs> um, I'll show you one of my goddesses here. Okay, so this goddess, <laughs> I've been, <laughs> I have been um, really thinking about a lot, and um, she's the goddess of growth and transformation. <laughs> and uh, again, I'm using a lot of different found objects. These are made from um, pieces of xylophones that I take apart. I'm, I'm a musician as well as a visual artist, so. I like to have music in my work. Um, so she is stirring it up. She's trying to grow and transform. Um, you know, if you think about a plant under underground and it's going towards the light, I think we're all trying to do that. So <laughs> especially during these times. So this is my um, goddess of growth and transformation. Yes, I wish I could just be her. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> so. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit about um, the Gateway Arts District because I'm I'm so blessed to uh, do a lot of programs there. Um, I work a lot with Artworks Now. A lot of artists, um, besides selling their work, uh, facilitate arts programs. So I get to work with senior citizens. They have programs at Artworks Now for toddlers through, again, um, folks in their 80s, 90s. So um, that's one of the beautiful things that I get, get to do in my life to help spread the arts. Um, and Artworks Now has pay-as-you-go programs and also um, many uh, free programs for older adults. So please check them out, artworksnow.org. Uh, dot, dot <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you a couple more things before my time is up. Um, as you can see, I've got my little thing here. <laughs> this is my, I think it's better back here. So um, a lot of my artwork is on my, at my Etsy store, which is Planet I'll just take the plate. Rachel at Etsy. So uh, via Gmail at helloplanetrachel at gmail.com. Let me give you a couple more little things here. Send a little more love before it's my turn <laughs> to go. Um, so I've been thinking about the, the human heart. I've been thinking about the human hand. I've been thinking about nature. I've been thinking about archetypes. All things that are empowering to us um, at this really transformative time in our history as human beings on planet Earth. And this is the key. Love. <laughs> That's it. However you can express that, send it out to other people, 
we're physically isolated, but we, you know, through great media like like Zoom here, um, and folks who know how to <laughs> help with technology, we are connecting. So send that love out. I'm sending that love out to you today, to all who helped make the studio tour um, possible, to all who are continuing to make programs um, where artists can make a living, promote their work, facilitate online programs, all the um, educational opportunities along that Route One corridor, you know, Joe's, Red Dirt Studio, Pyramid Atlantic, Artworks Now, um, Brentwood Arts Exchange, and all the affordable artist studios along that corridor. We love you and we appreciate you very, very much. Please visit me again um, and send me an email. I'd love to see you, talk to you, make art with you, <laughs> facilitate a program for you. Um, and uh, I'm at uh, planetrachel.com and I Etsy as Planet Rachel um, and facilitating some programs with Artworks Now at artworksnow.org. And I'm leaving you with more little gold leaf snail painting here today. <laughs> and um, a reminder, when you get overwhelmed, slow down. <laughs> slow down, okay? Breathe. <laughs> All right, my friends. Again, um, I'm going to stay in here and watch some of the other amazing, amazing artists today. This goes most of the day and um, it will, it's on YouTube, it's on live stream at the Gateway OST um, website. So however you're getting to us right now, thank you. We appreciate you. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. George's African American Museum and Cultural Center. Thank you for joining us on this mini virtual tour of one of our first exhibits, Footsteps to North Brentwood. The town of North Brentwood was incorporated in 1924, and what makes us so Prince George's proud of this town is because of the fact that it's the first municipality for African Americans in Prince George's County. We are proud to have our museum located right in North Brentwood. And even though we can't, you can't come to the museum, we're bringing the museum to you today. Let's go take a look at this powerful exhibit. North Brentwood was developed from a farm tract that was owned by Captain Wallace Bartlett. He commanded the 19th Infantry Division of the Colored Men in Blue. And these men came from all over Maryland, some from the Eastern Shore and other places in Prince George's County. And after the war, in 1887, they needed a place to live with their families. There were many different types of people, freed Africans who were enslaved, who were now looking for places to live, and other soldiers and, and different families. So what he did was he purchased the land and he called it Holiday Land and used that land to sell parcels for different families to purchase to start their family. That is the origin of the town of North Brentwood. Now, let's go ahead and talk about family life in North Brentwood. North Brentwood residents from the times of 1910 to 1920 took great pride in their accomplishments, specifically in their sense of mutual dependence and their strong family bonds. Also, the 1920 census reported over 93 differing surnames uh, living in North Brentwood at the time, and the majority of those were related to either blood or marriage. Names like Johnson, Randall, Thomas, Hobbs, Davis, Plummer, and Moore were all characterized by a strong sense of kinship and their mutual ties to the richness of North Brent. Gatherings, religious holidays such as Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Easter were well known and highly celebrated times of communal gathering when they got together to do meal preparation, uh, community planning, and remembrance of the family ties that they all shared together. 
The town of North Brentwood has been developing itself into a self-sustaining community for many, many years. In 1898, a transportation system came to the town of North Brentwood by way of the streetcar, very, very early compared to some other towns. The other thing that happened was that the citizens pressured this Prince George's County government to make sure that in 1902, there could be the first colored school located within uh, North Brentwood. Pictured here is the North Brentwood Elementary School class of 1949. And you can see uh, William Wallace Hall, the principal who later became a superintendent for Prince George's County Public Schools. In 1906, William Conway, founded the Brentwood Colored Citizens Association. And this citizen association that took care of North Brentwood made sure that the town got all of the things they needed from supermarkets to doctor services and many, many other things from founding some of the first churches in North Brentwood and making sure that this town truly developed into a self-sustaining community. Now let's go ahead and talk about church and community. Brentwood African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church and the First Baptist Church of North Brentwood have a profound connection to the citizens of North Brentwood because of the way that these two churches were potent symbols of unity and spaces where resources were collected, fundraising was done, and morality was developed for the people to be strong. Pictured here is the Reverend James L. Jasper. Jasper who was the pastor of First Baptist Church from 1906 to 1935. Every single town has people that have made it famous, and the town of North Brentwood is no different. So we'll start with one of the most powerful people, Reverend Henry B. Plummer. Reverend Henry B. Plummer became the first African-American chaplain in the U.S. Army in 1884. That's some powerful North Brentwood history. And even as you move on, Jeremiah Hawkins. Jeremiah Hawkins became the town's first mayor. So we have these two powerful kings. And then as you move down, we have Charles Bernard Tillman Sr., who became the first black sheriff in the state of Maryland. That's some powerful African-American history coming out of North, the town of North Brentwood. And then let's, we can't talk about black history in North Brentwood without talking about Mayor Lillian Beverly, who became the town's first African-American female mayor in North Brentwood. And not only is Mayor Beverly the first woman elected to be the mayor of North Brentwood, she is also one of the founding members of the Prince George's African American Museum, where we are right now. And so this, this whole museum would not be what it is today without her love and support. She's an original member of the Friends of North Brentwood, which became, uh, turned into the Prince George's African American Museum. I want you to check out your black history, specifically your Prince George's African-American history in your town, no matter where you're from, because you have revolutionary roots. Our roots are revolutionary here in North Brentwood and all over Prince George's County. So we'll see you next time for another virtual tour of the Prince George's African-American Museum. Continue to stay Prince George's proud and continue to stay safe.
So this is a active uh, 360 VR immersive tour. So you can click and drag if you're on your computer with your mouse to move around. And if you're viewing this on your phone, I recommend that you do it through the YouTube app. And with the YouTube app, it'll automatically scroll around as you move your phone around. And if you get the Google Cardboard glasses that are about $6 from Amazon, then you can wear it as a headset and have the full immersive effect. So the first room that you walk into is our gallery area. So due to the pandemic, we have postponed all of our gallery shows and we have hung up posters of exhibitions that we have done over the past five years. You'll also notice the walls are kind of beat up and that's because we had a major flood uh, about six weeks ago that we're still re recovering from. So, uh, as we walk over here, we're first walking into Gloria Chapa's space. And all of these artists will have a video describing their work that I will link to, uh, unless if I say otherwise, uh, I think all but two artists. So here we are in Gloria Chapa's uh, space. And I am just going to do a brief look around since the artists do have their own videos. I just want you to get the feel of what it's like to be here at Otis Street Arts Project. And you can also, I'll, I'll say pause before leaving each room. And if you hit pause, you can scroll around using your mouse or your phone and then just play, press play again when you're ready to continue the tour. Oh, and that little furry guy, that's Milo. He's my dog. And I'm hoping to do a company video uh, describing some of the shows that we have done. But if not, go to our Facebook page and our website and you can scroll down and see the shows that we've had in the gallery in the past. We've shown over a hundred artists uh, in our first five years, and it's, we're pretty pleased with that. So this is Liz Lesko's space. And Remember, you can scroll around, you can pause at any time. I'm gonna walk underneath Liz's work right here. And if you take your mouse or your phone and uh, you can either drag upwards or with your phone, just point it upwards, you can see uh, some of her work hanging from above. This is Gallery B. And this is only a fraction of the, sh well, it's most of the shows, but there's still some shows missing, the uh, posters that we just didn't have. And you walk over here and we're in Chris Bonner's space right now. And one thing about Otis Street Arts Project, when we're picking an artist, we, we try to pick artists in different skill sets and different mediums. Uh, and Chris is a steel worker. And the reason why we, we do that is so that we have an expert in each field so that the artists can learn from one another and fill in those gaps. Like if you need a base welded, then you can come to Chris and he'll help you out. Uh, so Chris will not have a video. Uh, Chris's face got hit pretty hard by the flood and he was displaced for several weeks from the studio. So I'll spend a little more time zooming in on his work. So, but you can go to Chris's website and uh, you can learn more about him there. So now we're walking over to Shelley Lowenstein's face. 
Shelley is inspired by beta cells. At the time that Shelley came on, we, we didn't have any painters. And so she was our expert on our color and our painter. Now we have other painters and other people as well. But that's just how we like to balance things out. And just a quick reminder that you can pause the video and look around. Close. And at home, Shelley primarily works on figurative work. So Otis Street Arts Project is a place where she comes to experiment. Hi, Kirstie. Oh, hi, Dave. How are you? Good, how about you? I'm good, thank you. So now we're entering Kirstie Little's space and Eric Gordon's space. And you can see Kirstie okay. there working away. On a new wire piece. And Kirstie has a video that she made where you can learn more about her work and her upcoming shows. At the On Fur Gallery. <laughs> in September. <laughs> so follow the links. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on her work. And this is Eric Gordon's work over here, the paintings. Eric also does these wonderful zines and is very involved in the zine scene. But here at Otis Street Arts Project, he likes to focus on his paintings. Great that you get to catch Kirstie in action working. <laughs> All right, Kirstie. Thank you. Bye. Now we're entering C.C. Cole McIntyre space. And don't forget to hit pause in each space and drag around and look around in the VR. Right now, if you look all the way up, you get to see CC's pieces hanging from the ceiling of her installation. Okay, now we're entering Art Droglis' space. Art is our woodworker. And Art does not have a video, but you can go to his Etsy page. We'll have links for that. You can also go to his website to learn more about his work. He also makes hot sauce and maple syrup. It's a nice way for you to see the tools and materials, and what artist studios look like. Straight in front of us is Beth Kern's space. That's her moon, which is a handmade paper.
And I'm going to stop here for a moment so you can pause and look around. Then just hit play when you're ready to resume. Okay, now we're entering the other half of Otis Street Arts Project. We have more studios back in here, but we also have our event space. So over here, we have a piece by Sean Hennessy, who co-founded this space with me and since has moved to Seattle. So this is a piece that he shipped out here for our five-year anniversary show right before the, the shutdown and we had to postpone the show till next year but we're fortunate to have this new work by sean here so you get a chance to see what it looks like and now we're entering lisa rosenstein's space Lisa calls it, it's a safe space, it's a peaceful space. And what does she have on her desk? I think uh, seeing an artist studio Let's you in a little bit on their thought process. And I'm going to stop, I'm going to pause right here so you can stop and look around. And just hit play again when you're ready to continue. And this is our event space. This is where we host lectures, public events. I set the chairs out, uh, even though we don't have an event, but just as a reminder of one of the things that we do here, we are a full artist space, meaning we have the gallery with with rotating exhibitions. We have the studios. Then we have the event space here where we where we do lectures. Uh, we host our, our critique, which is uh, we invite a regional guest critic uh, and two regional artists. And the public comes and gathers and we, we talk about it. Also, whenever the community needs a place to gather, we open up our door. And we have lots of other events that you can go to our website and look at some of the past events. Uh, one of the things we did was uh, we had this fun event that we called Wall Smashing Party. And eventually we'll have video of that uploaded. And now we're walking over to MySpace. I work with uh, 3D printing primarily, and these are my printers over here. Oh, and you can see me uh, right now in the mirror with my crazy contraction on my head. Normally I'm wearing my mask, but I just pulled it down when I walked over here. This is a print that I just finished. This printer can print quite large. And this is my studio. These are primarily 3D prints uh, directly in front of me. Uh, that's the latest work I'm trying to work on. Uh, 
with the large printer. Back here is the carving room and the dust room. I used to mainly carve, and so I needed a space that would contain the dust. And remember, you can uh, pause the video and look around. And that concludes our, our tour. Um, if you're new to Otis Street Arts Project, uh, please follow us on Facebook and sign up for our newsletter. And that way you'll be the first to know when we resume our events. And I just want to say that we really miss you, the public and the community. Uh, that's what Otis Street Arts Project is about, is, is community. It's what inspires us and interaction with the artists. And we just can't wait till we can all safely meet again. And until then, everyone stay safe. Uh, keep up with our YouTube channel where we'll try and post new, new things. And... Uh, that's it. Hi, how you doing? Uh, my name is Tom Hill. I'm a Portico artist. Uh, my studio is at Portico's uh, Galleries and Studios here in Brentwood, Maryland. And welcome to my virtual open studio. Um, I'm work now working on uh, a, a wood cut, um, a wood burning uh, that'll turn into another larger project, um, as many of my uh, pieces do. I'm mostly known for the abstract paintings that um, I've been doing for the last number of years um, that really explore, for me, color and form and layers and, uh, and sort of a whole sort of abstract feeling of um, underwater, uh, celestial beings, natural forms, uh, things that I have pursued uh, an interest in over the years. But there's another side of my work that I've explored off and on for throughout my career. Um, I save a lot of and collect a lot of different objects and pieces and things that I might use and incorporate in work. And um, I started doing these shadow boxes probably about a year, a year and a half ago. Um, I've had them sort of on hold for a long time and uh, then started sort of pulling out um, these pieces that happened over the years. And um, and started, you know, bringing them to a level of completion. And uh, through that process, this winter, right before COVID happened, I started exploring this whole idea of uh, uh, woodland creatures, uh, uh, wood nymphs, satyrs, um, all the way to lumberjacks, and, and, and thinking about uh, lumberjack culture and, and what that meant in terms of men being exclusively in community with other men and without women and uh, and sort of the the lies that have been told over the years about um, the lack of male intimacy that was happening uh, as a result of men living very in very close quarters with one another so I've been doing these pieces about the bunkhouse man about work camps about logging camps 
um, about um, these pieces of uh, st stories or little snippets of narratives about what it, it was like for men to be out in the woods with other men, working hard, doing hard physical labor, felling trees, and then what happened uh, in the bunkhouses at night uh, through camaraderie and all the way to male intimacy. And so um, that's one piece of it, but I've also been exploring this whole idea of, of what else happens in the woods. Uh, what happens uh, in terms of mythologies of wood nymphs and satyrs and all these sort of um, mythical beings that happen uh, when humans aren't around. The piece I'm working on here is very new and I have no idea where it's going to go. Uh, this is sort of the process that I, that I start with, but it's, um, as you can see from the other pieces, this will grow into um, an entire structure. I want to show you something that I'm working on right now. Um, First of all, I'm just so thrilled to be sharing this with you because a lot of this work hasn't been seen before. But here's a piece I'm working on now. Uh, when I talked about lumberjack culture, uh, one of the things that was uh, an interesting thing that I learned was um, uh, older guys and younger guys hooking up. And uh, they were referred to as um, uh, wolves and lambs or jockers and punks. And so I'm doing a piece here on, on punk um, using like a very young deer, uh, and, and, and this idea of beardless youth. So, you know, using a couple of different ideas, blending in together. Uh, so this is the piece on the, the wood plank. Um, this will get screwed onto here, and then it'll um, be mounted that way. So I'm using a number of different um, elements here, and um, I think this will be a pretty good piece when it's done. So just a matter of having this completely dry and being able to screw this down. Um, so this is sort of, you know, how things build out. Um, and um, uh, with each new idea comes another idea. So uh, I've just been sort of working through these things. And like I said, thrilled to show them with you. And um, thank you for uh, coming to my studio and seeing the work in creation as well as the stuff that's happened uh, in um, completion already. So... Um, this is sort of how it happens, and thank you for stopping by today.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Once again, we're about to start our COVID-19 panel. So we ask for you all to uh, bear with us for one moment. We're about to kick off our COVID-19 panel. All right, welcome to the COVID-19 panel. We're going to be discussing how COVID-19 has impacted the lives of our participants. We'll begin by having all of our participants introduce yourselves. And we'll begin with John Paradiso. Hi, I'm John Paradiso. I have studio number four at Portico Gallery and Studios, which is located in the Studio 3807 building in Franklin, Maryland. Thank you. And Margaret Boozer? Thank you, Pat. Hi, I'm Margaret Boozer. I'm the founder and director of Red Dirt Studio. We're an arts incubator in Mount Rainier, Maryland, uh, with currently 30 artists. And we're very pleased to be here. Thank you. And Jay Dura. Hi, I'm Jay Dura. I'm an artist with the DMV League of Artists. And I've been, um, I had a studio at the um, East, at the storage place on Rhode Island Avenue. Okay, and um, we're also joined by Luther. Okay, um, we'll move right on along right now. What we can do is if we're gonna begin with Jay as we have you up, Jay, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about how COVID-19 impacted you and how you may have had to shift your work and your business as a result of that. Well, it, well, first of all, I was blessed to, um, I still have a, a, a nine to five job that I've been blessed to, to still have that. So it's kind of offset the, uh, my, kind of offset my art career. It's, it's helped my art career. But I had to cancel, I, had, I was supposed to have a solo show in the month of um, July in North Carolina, I had to cancel that. I was in a um, art fa uh, art fair in Pittsburgh, Three River Art Festival in June. I had to cancel that. But otherwise, it's yeah, I've, it's there's been a lot of blessings. I've I've sold maybe two original paintings. I've sold like some some prints. I've had like three commissions. So I've been busy. Um, it, at first, it was hard to get motivated though because um, just. I was like glued to the TV, watching the, the news about the COVID and then the um, the racial unrest started. So I was really kind of, I had to cry my way away from my chair to go downstairs to, to my studio to start painting. But um, once I got down there and, and turned on a little music, I was, um, I, was in, I was able to get, really get into my, the pieces that I was working on. But it's been, um, I've been quite busy though. So would you say that um, while many people have been drastically impacted in an adverse manner, it appears that you were positively impacted in the long run? I, I'd have to say so. I was um, I, I missed out on a few big shows, but um, my um, supporters, my um, client, a lot of my clients have come through to have me do commission pieces and to, to buy some original work for me. So it's been a blessing. It really has been. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on now to Margaret. Margaret, can you share share with us how COVID-19 has impacted you and how you have had to reshape not only your business, but since you represent Red Dirt, you can share with us uh, some information about how the artists at your site have reacted and readjusted as a result of COVID. Thank you, Pat. Um, yes, <clears throat> being a studio of 30 people um, has definitely impacted us. One of the main things that we do here is we convene once a week. We have seminar and we do critical feedback, business of art. And of course, all that has had to move out of the center of the studio where we would meet in person and now happens on Zoom. Thankfully, we figured out safe ways for the artists to still be able to work in their independent studios 
But <clears throat> moving to Zoom is a real different thing. Um, we're, and we are fortunate that we have been able to partner with the Phillips Collection during this time. Uh, one of our studio members, Nehemiah Dixon, is the new Community Engagement Director at Phillips. And he helped us with this collaboration. We're doing hands-on with Red Dirt. And in fact, there's a workshop today over Zoom at the Phillips that one of our artists, Wendy Jason, is doing. She's the director of Justice Arts Coalition. Um, so, you know, while meeting over Zoom is less than ideal, we have found some ways to really give the artists some focus using that. And through these partnerships has really been part of that. Um, like Open Studio Tour, this has been a very, a great direction, focus for artists and help to produce some great content. Um, you know, lots of negative effects for sure, but <clears throat> I, I makes me especially grateful to be part of this community where I can sit in the front yard with my neighbors and work on police reform, work on open studio tour, how to elevate uh, the exposure for artists. And I don't think a lot of people get to do that. So. Thank you so much. Um, John, can you share with us? how COVID-19 has impacted you and how you've had to shift not only your artwork, but since you represent another gallery, Portico, can you share with us how your, your artists have reacted? Yeah, um, the Portico Gallery only has six studios. One's an artist in residence studio and then five studios. And so we've been able to, after a couple months into COVID, artists were able to come to their studios and work. I just clean a lot more and we wear masks and things like that. But when we had to shut the gallery down, um, personally, it slowed my work to a halt. Uh, I've had to, you know, I always thought that going to meetings and meeting with artists and going to galleries and museums were all in my way to get to my studio. And now that I have the studio and I can't go to those things, although I did just go to a show this week, um, I realized that I've lost, you know, that's where I got the energy and, and it really fed my artistic practice. So I've had to sort of regroup that. And so I plan time in my studio. So that way I'm at my studio when I plan for the week, I'd be there and I do the work I can. With that said, we're sort of well into it now. And I have been meeting with other artists started, you know, I've started to meet with other artists socially distant. And so that's getting my energy level up. All of the shows, 2020 was going to be a huge year for my uh, being out in exhibitions, but most of them have been, are going to be 2021. So I am hunkering down and working on a piece that's going to take me a really long time. And it's sort of going to be my winter piece, but I've started it now. As far as the gallery, we had to shut down. And uh, Pat, you know, I worked for Gateway for many, many years. I've spent the last 16 years trying to get lots of people in one room every other month. And now my thinking has changed where I'm gonna have longer shows in the gallery. We're looking at opening up in September, uh, having solo shows. So it's one artist mailing list and my mailing list instead of a group show. Uh, it's gonna run four months long. And I'm gonna have a minimum one small gathering of like 15 people at once a month and then maybe some afternoon teas, but really trying to figure out how I can get quantity over the four months of people seeing the work and promoting this artist, but also we are able to stay six feet away from each other. And, and in the fall, it'll be easier because I have a front porch. And so I'm going to like just coordinate off that only those four, 15 people will have the gallery and the porch and we'll see, it's going to be a work in progress. Uh, and then, I'm going to launch my um, uh, artist talks over Zoom, and I have been switching out the work. I have a, ex a residential exhibition program. And the good thing about the artist talks and the exhibition program here at Studio 3807, which is the building that Portico is in, is that I give honorariums. So I wanted to start that up right away so artists can get honorariums, because uh, I want especially the artists here to be able to pay the rent and buy supplies and stuff. So it's really shifted my thinking um, uh, to how to do it a totally different way. And, uh, and that's taken me some time. It's been challenging. 
Well, thank you so much, John. Um, we'll we'll move now to the the portion of the discussion that everybody's been waiting for. Now that we've talked, it's time for us to engage a little bit and to kind of build on what you were saying. I'm noticing in the chat, Pierre had the same thought I had, Margaret. You mentioned Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is a product of the Gateway Arts District. Those of you who do not know, Gate the Gateway Arts District is a destination. It's a destination where not only artists, but art-centered businesses thrive and where we nurture young people so that they can enter into the art world in a, in a bigger way. And it's a collaboration. Margaret, why don't you tell us a little bit about Nehemiah because he was at Red Dirt Studio. I think he's one of your nurturing uh, products or, or he right. came as a, as a part of your experience. We know Nehemiah is all of himself, but please share. Well, you're right, Pat, and that's one of the things that's so great about out, out here. I've known Nehemiah through all of his, you know, he was at Joe's Movement Emporium. Uh, he was at Artworks Now. Um, we, you know, and he's been an artist at Red Dirt during this whole time. Um, we helped him incubate his business, Nonstop Art, which was amazing. You know, it just kind of, it's like being a parent, right? Like you see, you know, Nehemiah is like extremely talented and connected and has all this power and energy to move through the world. And just to be able to help provide some space, help provide some connections and nurture that is extremely rewarding and, you know, feel grateful to be part of that. And now he's at the Phillips, connection, uh, Phillips Collection and he's just doing amazing, amazing stuff over there. And what he's doing is the first, one of the first things he did was turn back around and say, I want to help artists at Red Dirt. I know people need jobs right now. And this was his idea to do these workshops, hands on Red Dirt. So every couple of weeks, people have had an opportunity to do a workshop, get paid, reach a wider audience. And it's given them some direction to hone their practice during this time. So you know, that's a pretty special thing. And Nehemiah is, he's an amazing artist and amazing organizer. Absolutely. Um, now, Jay, you talked about kind of the fact that you missed a lot of, a lot of gigs that you had. There are a lot of productions that have stopped. And John, you also mentioned that you get energy and there is energy that comes from experiencing each other that I think many of us didn't realize the importance of. Um, Jay, I'm going to give you an opportunity to elaborate on that because you spoke to it um, very, very briefly when you gave your introduction and your elaboration on COVID-19. Right. So, I, you know, at first I was kind of in the house, kind of like everyone else, uncertain about what the, you know, what the new normal was going to be like. So I was kind of apprehensive of going out. And then uh, one day, uh, Kiana Clark called me and she said, uh, we're working on these murals for uh, the COVID, COVID murals for the George Floyd protest. So I, I went out there one day, one Saturday. Now I was just supposed to be helping the other artists with the backgrounds, but they asked me, they actually gave me a panel to do. And it was just, it just felt very liberating just to be out there amongst people in the sunlight and painting painting murals, there were other artists painting. It was just a really a great experience to be amongst other art, DMV League artists and other artists. And I, I really enjoyed that. And I believe um, the paintings that we did on, I was actually did a, a panel on the Clydes in, in Chinatown. And I understand that the painting is gonna be displayed during the, um, there's a march coming up on, the, I believe later on this, this month, the, um, a um, uh, rate um, that, I forget the title of the march, but there's a march coming up, and that the, these pieces are going to be featured there, and, and at some point they'll be put in museums. So that was really a great experience, and I thank Kiana Clark for for calling me, but she was trying to get me out the house though, because I was just kind of paranoid being in the house. So I'm still paranoid it. being in the house, but um, <laughs> you know, it speaks to the the level of collaboration. Collaboration is very very critical. It's yeah. critical, it's key, and we do it real well here in the Gateway Arts District. So thank you so much, uh, Jay. You're welcome. And uh, Lance, 
I see that we are we are joined yes. uh, by me? DJ Lance. DJ Lance, um, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves, and tell us about how you were personally impacted by COVID-19. Welcome. Yes, uh, thank you for, for having me. I just, uh, I just came, I'm at WPOW actually right now. Uh, a few moments ago, I, I, I left my radio show. It's on from 10 to 12. So that part of my life has been affected in a great way. I just uh, took the mask off that I, that I wear in the studio. And it's, it's it, one of the major differences is, is having to deliver a radio show with a mask on your face is extremely <laughs> challenging to start. But uh, on the serious side of uh, the COVID, uh, well, first let me introduce myself. I'm originally from Hampton, Virginia, uh, attended Hampton University. Uh, I'm here in uh, Washington, D.C. for the last 20 plus years, almost 30 years now. Um, and I work in the entertainment, events, and music industries. Also, I'm a business consultant. Uh, primarily, my consulting has been focused around entertainment, events, how to manage large groups of people. So when this uh, situation occurred, um, my business was one of the first businesses to be affected ne negatively and will probably be the last business to return you know, in, in, in its fullness. So uh, my entire career has been focused around bringing tens of thousands of people together. And so now uh, that is uh, uh, no bueno <laughs> to, to bring our degree. <laughs> so we're, the way I'm adjusting is uh, we're doing mu much more of this, much more online, much more virtual, many more virtual events. For example, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with the Fort DuPont Park concert series that happens every year. It's been happening for 40 years here in Washington, D.C. Uh, this year, uh, a few three weeks ago, we recorded Mesa, artists like Mesa, uh, Big Daddy mm -hmm. Kane. Really? Um, yeah, uh, folks like um, the new Soul Searchers, Chuck Brown's old band is reformed to, to do their 70s music. And a number of other artists, we, we got together over a few days to record shows that'll start tonight. So uh, it'll be a virtual Fort DuPont Park concert series. So that's, that's sort of the ways that we're adjusting. Uh, on the DJ front, uh, really quickly, uh, uh, we've had to go completely online. Some guys are doing small events, I've seen. Some people are doing smaller events uh, with low numbers of, of uh, attendees. But mostly we've all gone online and we've been met with rejection, wholesale rejection by the music industry that we, and the music that we help create <laughs> uh, because they cut us off whenever we uh, play, unless we have proper licensing. So I'm wait, we're waiting for the industry to catch up to what we're doing and uh, make it a little bit easier. Let me ask you a question about that. Yeah, that's kind of what um, I'm Yeah. Talking. My nephew's a DJ, and what he told me is that as long as he puts that message up that says, that disclaimer, right. that they let they let him go on, he was shut down two times. Yeah. Well, what are the new rules on that while you're there? Well, it, it boils down to uh, music licensing and copyright in, infringement. So if, if I'm playing a song over... Um, a broadcast entity of any sort, whether it's television, radio, and now the internet, is being broadcast to people. Now, once you step into the realm of broadcasting, then you have to deal with paying uh, certain royalties or certain licensing fees. So the mechanisms by which, uh, say, if I wanted to play a, a playlist of music, and let's say I wanted to pay the, the royalty on it, I wanted to pay the artist, the mechanisms by which that is done, uh, they're just not, they're not, uh, they're not consumer friendly yet. Yes. They're, they've been designed for larger organizations to, that want to become online radio stations, that type of thing. It's not really designed for a, a DJ uh, in his or her bedroom making music. So what I think we'll see is it, 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 uh, in the future, an easy, it will be an easier way for DJs to sort of register their playlists and pay royalties. There's companies like Mixcloud. Mm -hmm. Mixcloud, you can tell them about Mixcloud.com. They actually pay the royalty to artists, but they're in uh, the UK their copyright laws are a little different. So, uh, but that's one way to play music without getting dropped. Unfortunately, putting the disclaimer on is, it, it only works, you just have to be lucky not to be. Oh, okay. Lucky. Yeah, that's luck. <laughs> <laughs> that's luck. And depending on what he's playing. So if you're playing a lot of music that isn't copywritten, let's say when I do my go-go sets, a lot of that music is live music that isn't copywritten. So it doesn't get, you know, shut down. You know. Fantastic, fantastic. You mentioned that you're at one of my, my former radio stations. Oh, where you uh, want WP. 
I was the vice chair of the board of WPFW. Get out of here. Moved y'all from down in Chinatown to um, Adams Morgan and many of the transitions. It's really good. It's a public radio station. So I'm yes, thrilled. People, got it, people. Yeah, look, I, here you go. I, I, can, I can move this computer. Can you see that? Yes, yes. WPFW, there you go. Your well, station for you. Jazz and Justice. So when you do your radio show, are you doing it from home? No, actually, I'm here at the studio now. I'm, I'm here in the, in the building now. So we're on uh, K Street now. Yes, I know. Yeah, uh -huh. so I'm, in K, I'm at K Street. The, stu the, the, the uh, broadcast studio is right down the hall. Mm -hmm. So I, I came from uh, came down the hall and set up in, front, in the front area to, to do this. Well, you know, there are tools for people to do broadcasting, like clean feed, in a different place. I'm actually on the radio on Radio 1 now, and I actually have a clean feed, and I'm looking at some equipment what are the things that broadcasters to do for, can do? You know, people who are thinking about broadcasting, we have everyone trying to live stream, like us. But uh, tell us a little bit about what broadcasters can do. Well, broadcasters, if, especially if you're doing a talk format, if you're, if you're strictly speaking, you're not playing any copywritten music or any of that sort of thing, or if you've been even presenting original music that isn't, you know, that you own or whatever. But a, a normal broadcaster, the equipment, to get into this particular side of the of the business is very uh, simple. Like for instance, this right here, this mm -hmm. unit right here, can be used by a broadcaster, a DJ, or anyone else that that wishes to get into uh, the digital presentation of any sort. Uh, with that, this that device would handle the sound. And uh, you know how I have this microphone plugged in. That device can be held ha had for less than one hundred fifty dollars. So. The, the gate, the, the barriers to, to broadcasting online are, aren't that great at this time. So um, if you're a commercial broadcaster and you wish to do additional shows outside of maybe your radio show, if that's a great way to do it. Or if you're a person that just wants to put up a podcast all, or a DJ, that same unit that I just held up is the same piece that all of them would use. And well, you know that. tech is there. It's cheap. It's not, it's not that expensive. Well, it, it, it used to be cheap, you know, and um, we received the instruction for this video and people said, uh, the instruction said, the video camera we would recommend would be a Brio, a Logitech Brio. Right. And um, when we first started with COVID-19, I researched everything because I was in radio and I didn't want to go into the studio. I'm over 25, you know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I was trying to find every way to be home. And I looked at the little, um, uh, the gadgets that would allow you to do transitions and to maybe do something on Zoom and all those kinds of things. And they were yeah. all moderately priced. The Brio was going for $199. The, the other Logitech, the Logitech 920 is very close to the, right. to the Brio. I have an, I'm on a 920 now. Okay, okay. <laughs> but um, when that just started, the Logitech 920 was 60 some odd dollars. Yeah. And what happened yeah. after COVID-19? Yeah, all, demand. In case you're looking at other pricings, I'm an economist, supply and demand. Yeah. The, the Logitech um, 920 is now at about $200. And, and it's going to stay there for a while. So prices change and demand change. And let me give you an opportunity to finish what you were saying. Well, well, well you're absolutely right. Tech uh, has come down. I mean, even though you have uh, demand issues on certain pieces like webcams and so on, uh, overall, the cost on, on tech has gone up uh, for live streaming has gone down. And you, you could very easily be right at home with a broadcast level microphone broadcasting live from, from right from your wherever, an office in your house. Um, there's other companies that have stepped up. There's another company called um, Aver, I think it is, uh, that, that, that's making a new camera. I have one in my bag. It's over across the room, but it's it's cheaper than the uh, Logitech, but just as nice. So that you know, it has full 360, you know, and everything. So the, a lot of a lot of companies are stepping up to fill the gap or fill the demand because right now Logitech is killing them. Yeah, it's killing them. But but on um, Amazon and on many of the other platforms, the the prices are just getting to be a little bit ridiculous. I didn't give you a chance to finish. We, we did all three segments with you at one time. I wanted to give you a chance to finish how you were impacted because I, I interrupted you to catch uh, that. Yeah, well, no, well, just lastly, I, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. sum it up by saying I've lost a great deal of money. I probably around about 
thirty-five thousand dollars, you know, just just on, uh, and that doesn't count uh, the potential uh, for that's just money that you know was on the books. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about you know any other thing that might have come down the pipeline, and there's always things that come down the pipeline uh, during the summer. So, uh, so about thirty-five grand, you know, um, for, and it, and it's uh, so that's it's been extremely damaging. That's all I can really say. But uh, I'm an optimistic person. Anybody that listens to my radio show knows that I try to be optimistic. And, and one of the things I see, anytime there's great change, there's great opportunity. So I'm just looking for those opportunities. And one of one of them is, of course, the virtual space. And our presence here today is proof of how we're trying to manage, you know, this new world. So that's really it, you know. Um, well, yeah. when, is your, when is your radio show on? You wouldn't take the shameless plug opportunity, so I'll oh. give you the regular <laughs> plug yeah, opportunity. Every, every Saturday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon on WPFW 89.3 or uh, www.wpfwfm.org. And all my, uh, my all, just anywhere, just look up DJ Lance Reynolds, and I've got live streams that I do from time to time. Where, what uh, time is your on. show? And what day? What t day and time is it? Saturday. Saturday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. I just, I just came out of the studio. Saturday, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Okay. And um, for those of you who don't know, WPFW is a part of the Pacifica Network. Yes. The Pacifica Network is a network that was originally formed a philanthropist. Yes. who were wanting to make sure that public unfiltered messages got out to the public. Yes. And most of the other Pacifica radio stations, there are, I believe, five, five or six. Right, yeah. In different areas of the country. Uh, okay, those of you who are from New York know about WBAI. Right. And many other Pacifica radio stations. There's a, com most of them don't have music. That's right. WPFW is one of the primary Pacifica radio stations that has news talk and as we say, much, much more. That's right. So we appreciate that. One of the questions that came in the uh, chat is the uh, question about equipment. Are there other uh, pieces of equipment? I know I had the piece of equipment, I said the streaming equipment. Yes. I, uh, it was an Envato or something. I looked at it at the beginning and it was $29 and that's about um, anywhere from 99 to $200 now. What is, yeah. What's some of the equipment that you haven't mentioned that... Uh, well, uh, a lot of that, yeah, a lot of that stuff is app driven. So the applications a lot of times will uh, do the hard work. Mm -hmm. So what I would suggest to anybody that's trying to get into uh, this, on a basic level, you want to have some sort of interface. Mm -hmm. So look up the term audio interface. So this is one example of one. It doesn't have to be this one, but this is an example. It allows you to plug things in. You see the XLR and quarter inch uh, holes there. So that allows you to hook up a, a, a microphone like this or a studio mic. It has phantom power if you need to power a studio mic right there. So you need this on a basic level. Then the applications you use after that will uh, affect your broadcast. So there's things called, uh, a couple of programs. One is called OBS Studio. Yes. That's a very important one, OBS Studio. Now that's an open source program that a company called Streamlabs then took that open source and refined and added some more features and so on. So there's Streamlabs OBS as well. And there's a number of other uh, applications that manage a broadcast much like a television station. So, so uh, those programs allow you to uh, bring in different feeds, add images, uh, video, uh, bring in, like this Zoom call could be pulled into, an OB into OBS and shaped inside of OBS to look just like a real television broadcast. So this is um, this is where we are now, and th those are both free programs. Yeah. So you know, a microphone, an interface, and that program, and you're 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 cracking. I mean, you're you're definitely you know you you can do pretty much whatever you like to do from that point. Now there's some learning that you have to do. <laughs> there's a little learning curve, like you you know, it's not uh, as easy as just saying it. But the, the, the applications and the technologies, are, they're, they're there and they're not that expensive. Again, so for under 200 bucks, mic interface, you know, a light. I went, you know, to, home, to Lowe's to get a, a, a light uh, for less than 15 bucks. And that light, I can actually manipulate that light and make it do all types of different stuff. So the technology, again, under 200 bucks, you can, you can get into to live streaming, you can get into uh, uh, broadcasting your work online in, in a real way so so like for instance this uh this this 
light I bought, I could do change the colors with my phone. Oh, I don't have Wi-Fi on in here. <laughs> if I had Wi-Fi on in here, I could change the colors with my phone and, and create all sorts of different hues with it. And that's like a $15, $20 light. So again, technology is, is right at your, at your grasp. And it's not that expensive nowadays. And I, I, I can, you know, type up a little list if you if you like to give you. If someone oh, else I, I'd love for you to do that. And um, you've been so kind as I've kind of gone through all of your little phases at one time. I appreciate that. Uh, DJ Lance, what we're going to do is we're going to have you come and do a session. Oh, OK. So, um, you know, as we try and take a holistic approach to what we're doing, um, in this new norm, part of this discussion is to realize how you were originally impacted. You know, Jay said that when he began, you know, it was it was kind of devastating at first and you didn't yeah. want to go out. You were apprehensive about things like that. And then as things went on, you realized that you're going to have to do something because yeah. we can't stay in the house right. indefinitely. And so the thing that's most important to me um, being um, in the position of executive director at Gateway CDC is to realize what is the role of our community development, you know, corporations or organizations, and, and how do we help you, you the artist, to get right. through things. So the next question is, um, how do we feel Gateway can assist with the pandemic? And um, I'll let you begin the answer and then we'll go uh, right back to uh, Margaret. How do you think Gateway can help? Well, now, uh, at, at one time, you know, of course, it was about space and spaces, you know, actual physical spaces. And we've outlined that that is no longer uh, what the need is. I would say that now uh, we've outlined a need for equipment, you know, and really on a basic level. Equipment is what's going to allow uh, creatives to kind of share what they do. So whether it's cameras, interfaces, like I mentioned, that, that type of thing, uh, training on how to use these applications. Uh, uh, OBS Studio is a, and Streamlabs OBS, they're great programs, and they do, like I said, just about uh, all the stuff that a television broadcast studio does, not to the degree, of course, let me say that, but but close, I mean, close enough for, for uh, live streaming. So training on in the different applications, I'd say um, training on, um, training in general about uh, just new technology, and then how to apply that type of technology. We're, we're in, a, in a space now where uh, I, feel, I feel like one of the words of the day is applied technology. How do you apply technology? So, so uh, perhaps clinics on how to apply technology, how to use it, use this technology in ways to deliver perhaps a, a service, an artistic uh, vision, uh, you know, music, whatever it is. Okay. So, however you're trying to, whatever you're trying to distribute uh, how can you apply that? To you? So that that is a uh, because I think people have what they do down. You know that part mm -hmm. they have down. So how do I distribute it? How do I share it okay. effectively? And well, then um, lastly, I'd say training on if you want to train if you want to really be successful. I think that if we were to train people how to buy social media advertising, that thing right there would probably change the world. <laughs> Okay. Because it's not a, it's not an exact science. So, so you know, it's it's uh, uh, that would be a very valuable thing. So Fantastic. Well, thank thank you so much for that. You know, and we'll move over to Margaret right now. But Margaret thank actually you. mentioned. Thank you, Jay. Margaret, you mentioned something that was very very um, informative. That North Brentwood Council Member Charles Wiley is organizing a Gateway Arts District wide march. To the That's March right. on Washington, all That's down right. about one. Let me give you an opportunity to share that. And since you've been a member of the Gateway Arts District for for quite some time, I'm sure that you'll be able to elaborate on that. And then we'll uh, move to John uh, to elaborate as well. Go ahead, Margaret. Um, thank you, Pat. Um, yeah. So North Brentwood Council Member Charles Wiley um, has had a vision. Um, in fact, his he's calling it pathway to unity of unifying the four towns in the gateway arts district and doing basically a march to the march so if i could read a little bit here just so i can get this information out to you guys correctly on the morning of friday august 28th citizens of our community will walk in solidarity down the route one corridor to the dc border to express support of the goals of the commitment march the 57th anniversary of the march on washington 
Walkers can walk for one block or all the way down to the mall advocating for police reform, voter registration, participation, and an accurate census. The event is called the Pathway to Unity, supported by a collaboration between the residents of Brentwood College Park, Hyattsville, North Brentwood, Mount Rainier, Riverdale, and University Park. Local government representatives and advocacy organizations will have tables along the route. We're still, he's still looking for people to volunteer for that. Um, food distribution, census, and more. Um, signing up to make sure you register to vote. Um, the region's rich artistic community will also take part. Local musicians and artists will be positioned to perform for walkers as they pass by. Social distancing and masks are highly recommended and masks will be available. Um, there's a, a Facebook group called Gateway Racial Justice Team. There's also um, a group on the, the listserv by the same name. But if you want to, if anybody wants more information on this, contact um, me, contact Pat at CDC. We'll figure out how to get it to you. And uh, nor any of the council people from the towns will be able to give you this information as well. So thank you, Pat, for giving me a little minute to plug that and uh, to put out a pitch for artists and musicians to come join us. Pathway to Unity, uh, something we can get behind. Absolutely. Now, um, John, John's actually, as he mentioned before, worked with uh, Gateway CDC for a very, very long time. So, you know, um, John, you're an installation in the Gateway Arts District. And the question that was posed is, how do you feel Gateway can assist during this pandemic, during this recovery time? The organization? Yeah, the organization. You know, Jay was talking about how we needed more training and how then we needed to know how to how to use that training. I wanted to mention, Jay, when you were talking that, you know, um, OBS is an open source program just like Audacity. And I use Audacity and these are some very powerful uh, tools, but people need to know how to use them. People, John, as you, as you mentioned, people needed to learn how to do the videos for this. And so I envision us getting grants so that we can help to people become merchant ready, um, getting opportunities and grants so that we can help people learn how to, how to do the videography. The 360 that was presented by Otis Street was a wonderful way of people showing what's in their space. So since you were connected with um, the CDC for such a long time and and you've been in the district throughout for many many years I wanted you to tell us how you feel we can we can help well, well I, the idea that I have and it's just one I'll let other people tell you the millions of things you need to do but or what can do but I think um, the, the this year the website is working like a collateral piece like we used to hand out the map all year long right uh, I would use that all year long to promote the Gateway Arts District, to send people to Margaret, to send people to the Glass School. We don't have a map this year, but we have this great website. And now the website has all these videos embedded on it. And I think uh, either Gateway or right. the Arts Council so now you should like a, a panel uh, hire uh, Justin to speak. on a retainer to go all year long so he can keep updating it. Like, I would love to switch out some images on it. Um, uh, I would love to help the artists in my space and any space create their own videos of their studios who couldn't sort of get it together, you know, cause it, like, it is a whole different way of thinking and stuff uh, for some people. And then not even sure what does a virtual tour look like. So I think some people uh, couldn't jump in that way. Uh, and so, but we have the whole year. And I think to fortify the website and to continue really honing it, like it has been in this short time that uh, the, you know, Stuart and Justin and all uh, have been working on it. Um, if we had somebody working on it all year for a certain amount of time, uh, by next year, it would be perfect. You know, like it would be, and then it would just be plopping some things in. And hopefully next year we're going studio to studio, but still that that website is such an important piece. All the artists are there, the page is there, the links are there. You can now go into my studio from my page because I did a video. So I think that, you know, continuing beyond today 
to have people working on that. Uh, and, and your great group of people you hired to like videotape, maybe they're going through the arts district all year long videotaping people. Uh, maybe we now spread that to be a musician page as well. And we have musician videos and then we have dance and people are going to videotape some of the dance at Joe's or other places, you know, and just so then there's a visual art section, a dance section, the music, you know, so I think that, that what started with that website could really be promoted and you're using people from the arts district. So, you know, we're, we're spending money in the arts district and helping people in the arts district pay their rent in the arts district kind of thing. So, which I think the website is really, really wonderful. I, I, really appreciate how it looks and how it's interactive. Thank you so much. And um, that was the intention. The intention, by the way, those of you who are tuning in, and we're not sure how you're tuning in, but you can always go to our website. It is gatewayopenstudios.org. And to, to prove a point, people were saying, why are you having all these different points of entry? We have YouTube Live, we have uh, gatewayopenstudios.org, and you can go to their live page. Uh, we have a link for you to come into Zoom. If you're having problems, just let us know and we'll tell you because I tried all the other things on my separate computer so my family can watch and they didn't work. I had to go into the Zoom meeting. And so this will be something that will last for a long time. I'm going to um, move to and thanks, John. Was there anything else, any other suggestions that you had before you go? No, I think, you know, you continue to do the work you do. But that one thing I really wanted to plug because okay. I've been thinking about it and thinking about writing Rhonda at the Prince George's Arts Council and stuff after, you know, but because I had the opportunity to plug it, uh, I thought I'd do that now. It's the intention that will live. We've been joined uh, by the also person. Before we moved on, I had a suggestion, if, please, if I could. Please, 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 Jay. So, uh, so, so the scientists, uh, they seem to feel that being outside is better than being inside. So I was thinking maybe if uh, the CDC, um, if, we're, if we're in the same position next summer, if we could maybe look at maybe doing some out, outdoor festival, I mean, smaller festivals where we can con maybe control the number of people to go into the festival. But something outdoors where it's it's um, safer than being indoors. That's that's all I was thinking. Oh well, that that is definitely a a, a, a recommendation that we can we can fulfill easily. No, so I thank you for that. Did you have any other suggestions before we? No, that was all. Okay. No, thanks so much. Um, it, it, we're living in interesting times, and the key is being open, receptive, and being able to think outside of the box. And the gentleman you're about to hear from, who I'm going to do the same thing I did to DJ Lance on, now you can experience it, DJ Lance, um, is um, Luther Wright. Luther's the person who actually came up with this idea. He happened to be with Kiana when we were on a planning call. And we said, what would be more important, you know, just as important, what would be something that would be helpful to the arts community? And Luther said, I think we should talk about, you know, how we're getting through this COVID-19 and how we've had to kind of shift and refocus. So without any further ado, I introduce you to uh, Luther Wright. Welcome, Luther. Hey, what's going on? Um, tell us yeah, a little bit about yourself, Luther, where you, uh, uh, you know, about your artwork, where you're at, and uh, tell us a little bit about how you were impacted by COVID-19. Um, I'm a gateway artist myself. I'm uh, located right over there in Brentwood. Um, by the easy store, self storage, um, right down uh, from Saver. Um, so basically, I have a collective LW Arts and Design. We do like sip and paint classes, a lot of community um, arts programs. I was doing like program coordination for the uh, Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council, doing a lot of their pop up events. I also work with Kiana and the DMV League of Artists. So we go around doing a lot of the community. Um, events far as art and spreading art awareness. Um, but since COVID, it basically just shut everything down, especially a lot of the community events that we had planned and like, you know, moving forward into 2020. So it just shut a lot of that stuff down for us. Um, fortunately, we was able to get an opportunity through Busboys and Poets. Um, someone had broke a window at one of their locations. So 
um, Andy invited us out to kind of just paint up the storefronts and, you know, just give it like, you know, a vibrant look versus to having like that, you know, dreary look from the broken window and stuff. And it just kind of sprung forward into um, what we're doing now and been all over the DMV painting murals. Um, I've personally put up maybe about 60, 70 storefront murals um, along with the other artists that have participated in the group. So it's been a great thing um, that has kind of transpired out of COVID um, since the uh, whole pandemic started. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I know that you were on TV talking about what you're doing. And I think Jay said that uh, some of these murals are going to be curated and, and kept for posterity. Um, how has that made you feel? And how do we carry that on in different shapes and forms moving forward? Um, it's it's very a very humbling experience because I mean, like I said, we were just out trying to uplift the community, and um, you know, just trying to you know shed some light on the situation as artists and with our voice, you know, just to help out, and you know, it became more than we ever expected it to be. Um, so um, it was kind of like a blessing in the sky, you know, um, especially for a lot of the artists that um painted gallery place so they're going to do an exhibit on the 28th the same day as the march in dc so it's going to be exhibit at the uh, national building museum with a lot of our pieces that were uh, painted at gallery place so it's a lot of artists from um, lw arts and design and the dmv league of artists that will be uh, involved in that exhibit fantastic thank you so much and uh jay i'm going to give you an opportunity to pick up where luther left off because you said that you were the person who mentioned that uh, some of the uh, murals are going to be curated. What are the things that we can do to, to keep and to preserve what we're doing now and to give people an opportunity to think outside of the box and maybe collaborate? Well, um, I think this is a historical um, period that we're going through and, and it needs to be documented. And I think no greater way is, I mean, these murals, if we, if they could preserve them and put them in, in some type of museum, I think that'll be great. And um, so just so we can, so, so we can remember this time. Um, and um, I think it's good to be in art collectives and to, um, or any type of art organization to, um, to collaborate with other artists, especially in this time, because we, we, people have different resources or they have different um, information they can share amongst each other. And it's needed because some people need, uh, I mean, and it was also, you can collaborate financially. I've been um, donating to um, Prince George's Arts and Humanities uh, to help out other artists because I'm in a better position because I'm still, I still have my, my regular day job. So I just think it's, it's important for us to, um, join organization art organizations if you don't belong to one just so you can stay connected with other artists well you you let thank you so much you led us to our our next question which is how do we recover so you were the first so um let's ask do you have anything else to add to how do we recover jay um, I do. I mean, I think we do need to think out of the box and we uh, we need to i need to be uh, become a better um, do it on a better online presentation of my artwork or, you know, do some um, virtual shows. And I think um, maybe do workshops on how to do virtual shows. That would be helpful because we may be in this situation for longer than we expect. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think that that's something I know personally I need to work on. And I think other artists probably need to do that also. And do you have the um, the the capacity and capability of completing the merchant process, the capability to accept money online while you're trying to preserve the, the uh, security of your, your works. Because I remember when artists were beginning to put their work up online, it was so easy to take it down and to reproduce it, there were safety measures that had to be in place. Mm -hmm. So we do have to make an adjustment for that. Right, but I think there's so many vehicles out here that to, um to um, do transactions online now that um, you have, I use um, PayPal a lot. Um, you have um, Cash App, Venmo. Um, you can tell somebody send you a, um, what is it? What's, what's the one? Zelle through the banks. So, I mean, it is, 
Um, that doesn't seem to be an issue. And it, um, I think before, even before COVID hit, everybody was kind of gearing up to being able to do um, transactions online. Yeah, that's good. Thank you so much. Now mm -hmm. uh, we'll move and ask um, Margaret the same question. How do we recover? We'll, we'll do a two minute a piece here. Well, you know, <clears throat> so two things. A, my wife is on the school board in Prince George's County and B, I have a 10 year old son and in one week we're about to do remote learning again. And for me, um, that means I just turned down a commission because I have to devote half of my day to helping him manage his schedule so and to learn. So for me, how we recover is we have to get these kids back to school. And, we, and in order to do that, everybody has to wear masks and we have to be serious about this. We have to do everything we can to get out the message about that and to help people do that. We have to believe science and we have to vote. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we'll move right down the line, John. Uh, yeah, we have to support Margaret because she's a teacher now too. Uh, so as many uh, parents. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Uh, she's she's the one on the panel that I know. Yeah, I got you. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think you know. Um, that is the challenge, right? How do we recover? I am watching and listening to the leaders. Uh, I'm watching and listening to webinars on different galleries and how they're opening and how museums are opening or closing. And I'm just trying, for personally, I'm just trying to pay attention. And I personally think that I'm going to recover and, and my place here uh, slowly and steadily uh, because I want to be able to see all the like constant variables and to know where I'm screwing up or not. So uh, I'm hoping that um, everybody, you know, following uh, guide their own sort of harm reduction guidelines and and waiting for any kind of, of vaccine or breakthrough, we uh, need to like lower the curve so we're in a good state, not a bad state. And then we can start opening up. And personally, I'm opening up really small and letting it grow so slowly. Uh, that's just how my thinking is, like start small, grow slow. Fantastic, thanks so much. And, and I, I really was actually affirming what you were saying about Margaret. One of the things we need to do is we need to support the parents who now have to become teachers Kate asked me about that before, and I said, my, my nieces and nephews are starting to homeschool because they're in New York City and they're concerned. So not only do we need to take care of ourselves, but let's take care of our neighbors who have to really split themselves. Um, Lance, you're next. <laughs> With a mic out here. Thanks. Yeah, I, what I've been saying, and, and, and the, the question is, what? Uh, how do we move on? Is that was, that was the question, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, how do we recover? How do we, how do we recover? recover? Yeah, I don't know if the word is recover. Mm -hmm. How do we, I think the word is how do we adjust? You know, how do yeah. we change? How do we grow? Um, if you're familiar with intercollegiate athletics, uh, you ever heard of a red shirt year? Mm -hmm. You ever heard? No, of you can tell. You can tell us. Tell us about. Right, so when a when a, a person goes to play sports in college, right? And let's say they they made the team, but they they might have gotten hurt, or they some situation keeps them from playing, or maybe there's a better player that's ahead of them. They'll do something that's called redshirt them, which means that the this their freshman year uh, does doesn't affect their eligibility. They're still able to play for four solid years after their freshman year. So the redshirt year is kind of a year where you you just train, you learn, and you grow as an athlete during that that span of time. This is a redshirt year for everything, no matter what it is, no matter what walk of life. I, I feel like we should all be sort of going internal and, and training, doing what it is we do, getting better at it, uh, maybe figuring out something else that we want to do with our lives or the way that we do things, and cocoon that those concepts during this phase of time. I'm not saying that, that the world, uh, you know, that the world doesn't continue to, to turn as, as, as we're doing that. We may have to downsize. There may be some painful things that happen as a result. There may, we may have to uh, change the way uh, we do things. We, we don't have enough 
We don't have as much, uh, as many financial resources as we used to. So we may need to change some things. But overall, I think that this is a time for us to uh, train, to grow, to cocoon creativity, because this is the time where we, we come, creatives come uh, forward. Uh, creativity is what's needed right now. We, 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 uh, we say recover as if we're going to go back to something that we did before. No, I don't we're think we're going to be able to do that. So, so again, we need creatives like us, whether it's in the business realm or just in the uh, artistic mediums, to convey and express th those notions of growth and those notions of change. So, I, uh, and, and you know, just artists have to recognize who we are. We gotta, the creatives have to recognize who we are and that we're in control now. This is our, this is where we okay. uh, get down. So, uh, you know, and it's in the dirty muck of this crazy situation we're in that we'll find uh, the next phases uh, and the places that we'll grow into, you know? That, so that that, is, that's kind of where I, I don't think we're gonna recover. I think we're gonna have to change and grow. That's a, that's uh, and then lastly perfect. to offer, yeah, okay. and, and then one last thing, um, a specific tactic, a tactical thing, um, I was, as you guys were talking, I thought, since it's gateway, maybe there should be some sort of video wall, like maybe very tall, that's on a street, that mm -hmm. on either side of the street, you have these really long rows of video walls, right? Mm -hmm. And on either side, you can have artistic presentations and people can drive down the street slowly like they do for Christmas lights, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So maybe that's something. That's just a tactical piece, you know. Thank you. No, <laughs> you no, no. Thank you very here. much. That's a that's a nice way to segue over to uh, Luther. But before then, tonight there is a video installation that's going to be on the wall of the Media Arts Lab. At oh, perfect. The Mount Rainier Circle, and you'll be perfect. able to witness Mignolte's art expression curated especially for the Gateway Open Studio. Perfect. Store. So See, we are starting it tonight. Great minds think alike. That's uh, <laughs> Michelle Darden Lee and the production team. And Luther, I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell us. Thanks, thanks, uh, DJ Reynolds. Um, oh yes, yes. How you feel as as we've been annotated? How you feel we can reshape what we need to do to be in that post-COVID world functioning? How do we move? Um, well, I kind of agree with um, points that everybody said. I I, I do feel like. It's a time that we kind of have to um, embrace what's kind of happening a little bit and, um, and to make those adjustments. Um, things, you know, may not ever be the same. So, you know, looking at the fact that that may be the reality of, of, of our situation or just being conscious and prepare for what's the next uh, virus, <laughs> you know, so like just being like now that's in the forefront of just what we think. So I just think we just have to continue to be innovative and like you said, creative um, and thinking outside the box. And um, I think it's up to like a lot of the creatives to get out in the community. And like he said, we are the we can be the voice of, you know, how we move forward um, with our art um, and just the messages we portray on our art. Like um, I put up some things um, I put up murals that just say like, you know, thanks for wearing your mask or um, spread love. So it's just little messages to, you know, give people a, a identity of how we're trying to move forward as a community. Um, and just to piggyback off of what he said about the uh, community, I feel like even in Gateway, it was something that I thought about having maybe like a, a art park or art community, like a art walls where, you know, artists can come and you know, uh, put up different murals, get experience. So this way it helped build the culture of murals and and uh, artists being able to put out their messages and spread their voice in the community. Um, and that way we'll, you know, like I said, it's more so just embracing what's going on. Um, a lot of parents are being forced to become teachers. and But at the same time, they're, they have opportunity to spend more time with their children. So like, you know, I think we got to look at some of the light side of, of what's going on in this time of uh, creative do have more time to sit and hone their craft. Um, since the pandemic, I had more time to just, you know, sit down and research things that I wanted to do moving forward. And it's a lot more time that we have now that we didn't have before. So I think that's why the arts are uh, being highlighted more than ever because people are taking the time to actually slow down and pay attention, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, a pivotal time for us right now to, you know, uh, get out there and, make a voice and make it more. so um That's like recovering good. like i said it's, it's not really so recovering like you said but just moving forward and, and adjusting to how we move. 
Yeah, um, Luther. I'm going to give you yeah. an opportunity to start us on the close. We we got us okay. we were able to get ourselves back on schedule. I don't want to to mess that up, but I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to have a one minute uh, closing statement. So we'll start with you since we're on you, Luther. And thank you so much for participating. Your one minute oh, no closing. Problem. Statement. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Luther Wright. Um, I'm a uh, part of the movement, Paint the Storefronts. Um, I just thank every artist that came out and that supported that movement. Um, I support every artist that's out here uh, moving forward. I know how difficult it is right now. So if I got any opportunities, I'll forward them over. Please reach out to me. I'm an open book. Um, I'm all over the DMV. So please reach out to me. Thanks so much, uh, Luther. We'll go right down the line up top. That's uh, Lance, you're next. Okay. Uh, uh, DJ Lance Reynolds is my name. And uh, uh, check me out on WPFW. And, uh, and be sure to follow me on, online. It's everything for me is DJ Lance Reynolds. And lastly, I'd just like to say that, you know, everyone lead with love. You know, try to love as openly as you can. And to uh, love as a child does. You know, think like a child. You know, that my, something my... Uh, grandmother used to tell me all the time, you can bend a sapling, but you can't bend a tree. So, you know, the notion behind that is, you know, a young tree is very easy to manipulate and bend. A, a, a tree is, is can be difficult because it's, you know, reached its maturity. A lot of us are, are have reached our maturity. But if we, this piece, though, the mental piece, can think just like a child, and we can bend this and shape this however we wish to shape it. So we need to remember that and lead with love, think like a child. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And on down the line, Margaret, you're next. Thank you, Pat. <clears throat> well, I think I would just say <clears throat> that, you know, the technology and stuff that we're doing right now is amazing and how we're getting this message out and connecting. But also, let's don't forget that we can walk outside and sit on our front porch and talk to our neighbors from the sidewalk and have a beverage together. And we're in a community where we're fortunate to be able to do that. And those are the connections that make the rest of this stuff work. Thank you so much, Margaret. And John? Yeah, uh, so uh, if you're not on my mailing list, Portico 3, uh, go to my website, portico3807.org. Uh, we are a resource for artists. I am always looking uh, for new artists. I have open submission call. I put everyone on file. I just need your links. And I'm always looking to have more people do artist talks and or hang upstairs because I really want to sh you know, spread the wealth. So uh, look for me online, thanks. And vote. Yes, yes. Vote because your life depends on it. Thank you so much. All right, see, I knew it, see? <laughs> your life depends on it. And uh, Jay? Yeah, just briefly, I've, I've been able to stay optimistic through this time, through my faith. And um, it's, it's carried me through, and I'm optimistic of what's going to happen in the future. Okay. And, um, well, that, that, that concludes our, our panel just about on time. Um, I, I thank each and every one of you. you. You've all added to helping our community learn about not only how you reacted and responded to COVID-19, but you've probably given them some insight as to different ways they can think. So I'm going to suggest one, that everyone continues to communicate with each other. Uh, Gateway will open up its doors and we will react and respond to all of the recommendations that are made, but it's not about Gateway. And while we keep saying Gateway CDC or Gateway Arts District, mm -hmm. the whole notion is that this applies to anybody, to anywhere. We need to make sure that we still talk to our neighbors, that we have some human interaction, and we need to make sure we're thinking outside of the box. But in this day and time, we need to always have at the forefront of what we do, bringing each other together and sharing information and sharing love. So I'm going to get lead, um, end by adding some of the few things that you said. DJ Lance, we're going to think like a child and we're going to lead with love. So I thank all of our panelists. I thank those of you who are listening. For those who are on the, um, the live feed, I can tell you that uh, later on this afternoon at about 1.30, we're gonna have a panel on Black Lives Matter. And until then, use your vehicle to come in, but 
think like a child and leave with the love. We're signing off and have a blessed day. Stay with us. to capture us from our lens, our own lens. So my work is representation of that in a minimalist style. And yeah. My social media is Michelle with one L, the French way. And my website is michellemelisson.com. videos on this. Joe, we're unable to hear you. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. And um, sorry about that. I thought I had all my technical stuff uh, ready to go there. Um, hopefully, you guys can still hear me. But anyways, I was just talking about um, how my studio is here at my house in Mount Rainier. And um, normally, uh, I fire in a larger kiln, um, and I normally do um, you know, high temperature ceramics uh, based on Shino work, um, which is a traditional Japanese um, glaze. Um, and you can kind of see all that stuff on the video from uh, not only my website, joehickceramics.com. I got a special page devoted to the Open Studio Tour. Um, but I also have some videos on the, the Gateway uh, Artist page for the um, for this event. So um, I'd like to thank Gateway um, and everyone who was involved in this. Uh, it's been a really great event. You guys were working really hard. So I'm um, pretty excited. What I'm doing today is just kind of a little of, uh, excitement to get you guys, uh, you know, motivated to get involved with ceramics. Um, this is a real 
kind of easy way to fire. It's how I learned how to fire with fire. <laughs> um, it's a low temperature um, style of ceramics called Raku. Um, again, it's a Japanese tradition from I think around like the 16th century or so. And um, uh, it was uh, uh, originated by a famous pottery fa uh, family called the Raku family. Anyways, um, what they would do is they would pull out uh, like um, vessels from the fire at really hot temperatures and it, it would like do all these cracks and kind of effects um, but um, the way that it's evolved today is Americans um, have kind of taken it into a little bit different direction um, and you can see I've got these cool um, pots I just pulled out literally uh, like maybe 15 minutes ago um, it's kind of the uh, microwave of ceramics I guess um, but uh, what's really interesting is, and what you'll see me do, is when I pull these out, um, I'm, I'm going to lift the kiln up while they're glowing hot, and then I'm going to put them in this bucket, and there's uh, a bunch of, like, wood chips and things in there, and what that will do is create an environment to where uh, the metals, um, copper and cobalt that are in the glaze, will flash and create all these, like, really brilliant colors. You can kind of see some of those effects, I think, right here. Hopefully the sun is picking that up. But um, anyways, uh, you called me at the perfect moment. I have been waiting on keeping these pots hot just for this particular uh, time. And so I'm just going to pull these out. i got to turn my back to you. <clears throat> and so this is just a little, little bit of safety here. <laughs> Okay. All right. And I'll turn this off. And you'll see them, they'll be glowing red hot. And, and some of them, what I'm going to try and do is I'm just going to try and let some of them sit so some of the glazes crack a little bit. Um, and uh, we'll, well, we'll just see what happens. Okay, so you got to kind of be quick. Whew, that's hot. So I'm going to put this one down. Let that cool for a minute. Put this guy in. Okay. Put this guy in. Woo! And you can just pop a couple more on there. And then shut the lid. All right. So this is the exciting part here. I'm going to, I got some of these other pots lined up, ready to go. And what's exciting about this way of firing is that you can, you can go through a lot of firings in one day. See, normally when I fire my large kiln here, which is just right out of your picture, it that's like you know i fire i'm literally firing for like 20 to you know 18 to 20 hours and then it takes three days to cool so that's the type of timing that goes with that type of production but this ceramic goes at a much lower temperature so it's more flexible and you can do all sorts of crazy things with it and so what i can do there we go is I can have like, you know, I can fire all day. I can go up in temperature in like maybe 30 or 40 minutes and then have cool pots within like 20, you know, so you can have a whole round of pots within an hour. So it's really exciting. All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Just close the lid <laughs> and I'll just reignite and then I'll just let that sit for a little bit so nothing blows up. Um, there's a lot of moisture in the air today so these pots can, uh, can really um, uh, absorb moisture and if, if they're in too, you know, uh, hot too quickly it'll, it'll blow up but I think I'm getting chimes so 
Um, anyways, if you want to see um, any, some more videos, I got some cool videos on, on my YouTube channel, Backyard Pots. You can find all that stuff on my website, Gel Hicks Ceramics. Um, I'm going to be popping these um, pots I fired today online so you guys can check it out. And uh, appreciate you stopping by and visiting my studio and enjoying my, uh, my Raku style. So uh, stick with the uh, Gateway Tour and enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks a lot. Right? Could you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Was that cool?
Is everybody on? Yes. Can Hi. everybody hear me? Yes, you can. How y'all doing? Greetings. How's everyone? <laughs> Great. Doing all right. Um, let me check to make sure. I see Kiana. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, so hi, hi everybody. It's uh, it's about 1.22. We are getting started. Um, I've been excited about this for a few days now. Um, I am Michelle Darden Lee. I am the program director of the Gateway Media everybody. Arts Lab in Mount Rainier, Maryland. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the Black Lives Matter yes. panel yes. discussion yes. for the 2020 Open Studios tour. Great. Great. Am I hearing somebody? Um, check to make sure. All right. Um, so okay. we're here today because okay. so, hi, hi everybody. It's um, it's about 122. We are getting started. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Um, so we're here today because we wanted to take some time to examine how the Black Lives Matter movement has affected our artists and the artist community, um, particularly those artists in the Gateway Arts District in Prince George's County. And we also wanted to talk about how um, our artists and their work can influence and shape the Black Lives Matter discussion. So um, all of this is an effort to move this country forward around the racial gap, which you know has existed for centuries. Um, but you know, I think this may provide a unique opportunity. I hope it will provide a unique opportunity for us to um, finally begin to build some bridges and to help us heal around this, you know long, as they call it, original sin of our country. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get started by introducing our panelists. Kiana, there you are, Kiana, Kiana Clark. Kiana Clark is an artist. She is a curator for the Gateway Media Arts Lab and 39th Street Gallery, and she is the founder of the DMV League of Artists. We have Ronya Lee Anderson, who is a scholar, educator, and an artist who has performed nationally and internationally. Um, and she's currently a doctoral fellow at the University of Maryland School of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. We have Alonzo Davis, who is a longtime advocate for Black artists. He is the co-founder of the Brockman Gallery, which I, I, I believe, Alonzo, correct me, is the first major gallery run by and for Black artists. Um, he is also the founder of Air Studio Paducah. We have Elise Perry. Elise is a veteran music producer, composer, and video director. She is the founder of Vo Art Media and the president of the DC chapter of the Recording Academy. And we have Chuodros Melkeshua Williams, who is the founder of Visual Jazz and the chair of the Department of Fine and Performing Arts at Bowie State. Thank you all for joining us. Kiana, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to start with you because I know you have some really, really great work coming up around Black Lives Matter. So I want you to start off with telling me about that. But I, I do also want you to, you know, tell me about the personal side and how Black Lives Matter has, has um, you know, has affected you personally and professionally. So um, personally, I think, you know, as an artist and as a Black woman, you know, this is something that we've gone through for many years. Um, I think now that, you know, people that are outside of our community are seeing, you know, the struggles that we've endured, you know, over the years. And now, um, you know, it's unfortunate that someone had to lose their life for other people to understand what, you know, we've gone through as a race. But, um, you know, that's where we are right now, that's the circumstance. Um, as far as, you know, as, as an artist, um, <clears throat> it's blessed me because I've been able to um, use my artistic voice by providing murals and stuff for the city. So again, like I said, fortunately, it's gonna have to lose their lives for us to, um, to evolve. Um, you know, I've actually been blessed. I have a mural on um, Getting Gallery Place that stamps the Black Lives Movement as well as COVID-19. My Black Lives Movement um, murals also stamp COVID because my, um, Subjects have vast one. Um, I also have one that's on the Mourner Theater that stands for Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, as well as um, Smithsonian, actually is maybe picking up a mural. So um, my piece may be in a Smithsonian and then during the march that they're gonna have on DC, they're gonna be presented on the lawn of the National Museum. 
Um, I also have a mural coming up that's going to be on the um, St. John's Church. Um, you know. Okay. So. <laughs> good. So again, I, you know, because of a tragedy, yeah, a tragedy has blessed me as an artist. But unfortunately, again, um, people have to lose their lives for the messages to get out. Yeah. Um, so, Tiedros, let's go to you because I, I, you and I chatted a couple of days ago, and um, there's some interesting developments going on in your department as well. So, yeah. um, same thing as Kiana. Talk about that, but also talk about how the movement has affected you personally and as an artist. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh huh. Okay, great. So greetings, everyone. Um, you know, for me, I look at this more as a continuum, uh, meaning that, um, you know, this this has kind of been a, a part of my, my work, you know, before Black Lives Matter. Um, but I, I'm, I'm really excited by the energy that I'm seeing, and especially for my youth and our young people who are always been the, the change makers and leaders, we just look at history, right? Um, so for me personally, uh, I, I've done some projects uh, that focus on police brutality, actually it's part of my graduate thesis, uh, focusing on police brutality and and other ways to sort of honor our ancestors and things like that and, and really to provide a sense of healing. Um, so kind of moving forward to where I am at Bowie State, um, we in the Department of Fine and Performing Arts, we, we have been really looking at um, kind of creating um, an area for our students to be able to, to respond to things that are happening uh, as artists, as filmmakers, as musicians. And we are actually um, been looking at developing some possible courses in uh, what we call socially uh, conscious art making or, or, or artwork that deals with uh, art, music, I'm saying this in a general sense, that, that basically responds and gives our, our young people an opportunity to respond to everything that's, that's going on. Um, so last uh, year, year or two, our, our previous chair, Gina Lewis, ended up doing an event uh, for BSU, Bowie State University, but it was Build, Serve, Unite. So we're looking at how art, music, um, you know, film, media, fashion, how we can use these mediums to really empower our people and really bring about uh, change. So that's something that we're looking at as a department is actually develop some, some courses. Right now, so it's kind of a biannual um, uh, conference that we're, we're gonna be doing, but hopefully we'll have some courses in socially engaged art and socially engaged media making. Um, and then I'll, I'll share some, some other projects I'm working on later. So Teardress, how long does it take for a program like that to come online? Uh, it could take, well, to get a course running, it takes about a year. I mean, we, I think individually professors and artists in, at Bowie, in our department at Bowie State have been doing the work, so to speak. I, I'm going to definitely give kudos to one of my colleagues, Jennifer White Johnson, who has been uh, using design, graphic design specifically to focus on not only the uh, voices for, for Black Lives Matter, but she's even been focusing on voices of, of the Black disabled community and people with special needs. And so, as a matter of fact, one of her images was actually retweeted by uh, President Obama. Uh, for Black Autistic Lives Matter, because we don't realize how a lot of these victims are, are people with special needs. A lot of uh, victims of police brutality have autism or some other type of disability, and people may not understand how to communicate uh, effectively. So we, we're looking at that, that issue as well. Um, and so, yeah, it, it probably takes about a year or so to get a course, but to get an actual major, that could take about maybe three to five years to actually get it up and running. But that's something that we're looking at is how Bowie State as an HBCU, how we can create and, and a, a, a course or some coursework or areas of research in terms of bringing art and activism together. Nice, nice. Um, Ronya Lee, tell me how Black Lives Matter, you're on mute too, I want you to take, there you go. Um, talk about how Black Lives Matter has affected you as an artist. Yeah, no, I think that's an important question, especially given where we are. For me, uh, similarly, it's been a bit of a continuum. So I feel a little bit like, oh, okay, now everybody doesn't just think I'm the race girl, <laughs> the person who's always making the work about race. Can't you talk about anything else? Uh, and so it is nice to feel sort of an energy that's happening nationally um, that goes beyond the work I've been doing. Uh, for instance, one of the works I just finished in 2019 was called Black Madonna and Miss America. Uh, looking specifically at the different ways that we view the Black female body. So, you know, how we see Sandra Bland versus how we see Beyonce. Uh, and, and if and when Beyonce is not, you know, dressed up, might we mistake her for Sandra Bland and how we give sort of uh, value to certain types of Black female bodies. And so uh, the 
And the closing song for the work uh, is called Say Her Name and, you know, sort of nods to Corinne Gaines and to Sandra Bland. And I remember when I was making the work and presenting it, there were people who would come up to me afterwards and go, why do you say, say her name for so long at the end? Um, and so what I think is really fascinating is that just a year later, people would see that same work and they would know exactly what was going on. Okay, okay. <laughs> so sometimes you just have to press on and then sort of folks sort of not catch up, but folks sort of get on board in a natural way. And so I hope to just continue doing that with Black Lives Matter um, sort of as a fuel uh, to move forward. I'm going to, I'm going to, I probably should have um, asked Kiana and Tio this as well, but I also want to know how this has affected you all personally. I mean, I, um, you know, when the protest started, uh, there was a period where I couldn't stop crying. You know, that's just the truth of things. And um, at first, I, I, it's not like I thought I was the only one, but as I began to talk to a lot of my friends, I realized that that was more the norm than not, you know? Um, so, you know, tell me about that for you all personally, and you know, you others can jump in as well, but, you know, uh, particularly with the piece that you're working on, Ronya Lee, that you were working on. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting because I got a lot, a lot of folks reached out to me afterwards and said, gosh, like, I appreciated your piece a year ago, but now I have sort of a greater appreciation for what you were doing and where you were coming from. But I think for me personally, and I'm coming up on a new work that's gonna be happening in October, that is kind of a gallery gallery piece that people move through, but with movement um, and de dealing with some of these same issues. And I think for me, I liken it to kind of being, someone knocks on your door at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> and you grab your robe and they're like, hey, let's talk about race. And you're sort of like, okay. Oh, you want to talk about it right now? Okay. Right, um, and so it's a little exhausting in that way. Not that it's not something that shouldn't be at the forefront because it should, but it also feels like now it's just constant, constant, constant. Um, and so what I've done is tried to really engage in reflection and, um, in self-care and letting myself um, kind of feel those emotions and not feeling any type of new responsibility because I really feel like I've been doing the work. And so I'm just gonna keep doing the work. Um, I don't need to take on an extra thing now. I just need to keep doing what I've been doing and listening to what's happening in the world around me. Okay. Um, before I move on to Elise T and uh, Kiana, do you all wanna hop in on that? Sure. Um... So for me, um, I, 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 it, it makes me sort of go back to a project I did, um, which was called Silent. I collaborated with a, a poet kind of on the U Street scene uh, back when it was Coffee House. I'm sure at least and everybody remembers U Street. U Street. Um, and we did a piece on police brutality called Silent. And that was back in 2000, right? And so for me, it's like, yo, it just got so much worse like i mean back then it was amadou diallo and trabador coats and i was interviewing different folks here in pg county and in and, and maryland who had been impacted by police violence but that again that was 2000 it's like it's like three thousand times worse and so um I, i'm looking at how i can um there's a film project i'm working on right now to sort of respond to it because yes it's, it's definitely something i've been affected with i've been i've been the victim of you know police brutality and have been have had my encounters with 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 uh police as well and so uh, but now that I'm a father and now that I, I'm working with young people, I'm very, very concerned for, for all of our young men and women. So I think it, it could be very overwhelming uh, and very depressing because it's like, um, you know, so many, so many uh, stories of, of things that are happening. But I think as an artist, as a filmmaker, I really want to reflect on the healing aspects. So just like, you know, my sister Ronya Lee said, just in terms of how we can really build from this, because it really can dampen your spirit and really can take a lot out of you. So I think the, the where I'm trying to go now and moving forward with my own film projects is to kind of use film and, and, and animation specifically as means of, uh, as catalyst for change um, and as a sense of healing. I think I'm really looking at the healing aspects of, uh, you know, what, what we've gone through as a people. Um, you know, as far as my feeling about it, um, I went to a predominantly Caucasian high school so everything that's going on now for me is something that I've dealt with my whole life. I was raised to move a certain way. You know, my dad actually um, was raised in Culpeper, Virginia. 
So um, even to this day, they still have race relations and they had it before. I remember when my mom, stepmom was telling me that, um, you know, during the Obama election, we came here and she's like, oh my gosh, there's white people with Obama signs in, her, in front of their houses. And we're like, okay, that's normal. And she, <laughs> no. she says, no, there, you know, there's someone has an Obama sign in their yard and it gets destroyed. Mm-hmm. So um, again, you know, even though we're going through this movement, it's something that, you know, I've witnessed all of my life. Um, you know, you could, when I was in high school as well, you know, we had a situation where someone put a um, spoon in someone's locker, a black person's locker, and they said, should people own our, and then, you know, the N-word. And it ended up being like this big riot. <laughs> you know, they were afraid it's going to be a riot. Like they called in civil rights activists to come to the school and speak to everyone. So again, this is just something that's kind of normal. So I guess when it happened, I, I didn't, I mean, it touched me, of course it did, but um, I'm so used to it as normal to me that it's like, okay, finally, everybody else can see it. Mm-hmm. That's how I felt about it. And, um, you know, again, being went to a predominantly Caucasian school, and then, you know, you have DC, where it's predominantly black. A lot, I've learned that a lot of my peers who were raised in this area, sorry, who I actually was born in DC, by the way, but I went to school in Virginia. So here, you know, they didn't see what we saw because it was normal to them. Even, even, you know, Caucasian people saying the N word here, a lot of people say it's accepted because, you know, they don't own it and all of that. And I'm like, someone like me, I take that very seriously because I've been called that. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's how I feel about it. Again, it's um, my personal feeling is finally other people can see what some of us have seen all of our lives. Elise Perry, you're on mute. Um, yeah, so you and I chatted as well, um, but, but start off with how Black Lives Matter has affected you as an artist, and then tell us, um, I know about um, the programming that, that's happening within the Recording Academy, but also if you have anything in Bow Art Media, let's hear about that. Well, um... First of all, uh, you know, I hate that this brutalization is so normal that I haven't been turned upside down. Um, All I could say is that personally, my focus for the last year or so has been on healing it's been on self-care and to see how I can extend that to people outside of myself. So I I made sure that my my music was uh, very much about that, Um, that there's plenty of everything else out there that I don't have to do any um, classy ratchet, you know, I think that's fine, you know, however people can embrace that or not, that's, that's for them. But I had a different, uh, I have a different thing going on here musically and creatively. Bo Art Media creates, you know, music and visual content. And uh, one of my content uh, ideas was to have uh, the 5D life. 5D life, not a camera, but living life in five dimensions. So you taste, feel, smell discern, um, understanding, all of that. That's the content that I want to bring forth. And that could be music, that could be thought pieces, that could be a film, that could be a number of different things. But um, what it didn't have to be is what's so popular. And it's me, and it was just me opening up. And so in that development, in developing those ideas, what came to be was that people actually liked it. And actually it was something that people felt like they needed to see or needed to hear. And as time went on, I just felt like I was doing the right thing and helping people have something that's an alternative. And when when all of this came along, I just was, it just was the medicine. It was, it just felt like, like, Rania was saying, We're, I'm still on task. I'm still on task. Um, technically, I've had to pivot. 
I'm here. I'm running these Zooms now, technically. I'm running hop-ins and all these different things. I'm learning new things because technically, even as a television film pro professional, it's shifted. We're not in the studio. We're not in the places where, we're, where I'm recording uh, meetings and, and, and performances and newscasts or whatever it is. I'm not there. I'm being paid right now to be on hold. So I'm on hold. Yes. Yeah. So it's a wonderful thing. It's a blessing. That's a blessing because I'm now I'm at home. So we, we, so the pivot, here we go. We pivot again. So now I turn my home into a place where I can actually generate um, income and enjoy. And so now I have to build up my situation. So I, I've, I've purchased things to to augment that, uh, the power uh, by way of internet or just by video things. I've had to make major pivots. Um, so the food I eat is the same, you know. I don't have to do a whole lot of different things with my health, God willing. Nothing will change in that in that uh, area, but it's just it's just a pivot. And then you know you do that and you treat people better. You treat people better, they treat you better. I, I think the hardest thing is to be the the sounding board or the answering person for people who don't, who just like, I don't want to be the racist. I'm not a racist. Okay, I, I, I'm now ready to accept that I have privilege. And if you want to go deep with this, as a light-skinned black woman, I think I kind of get it. That's the truth. Okay. I think I kind of <laughs> get it. Yeah. I know where sometimes, you know, I get something that maybe some of my browner sisters don't get. So I get it. So I'm not saying I understand how, be, uh, how to be a white person, but I think that being real enough to, to know that acceptance is truly the first start I'm willing to answer a few questions here and there um, from a, a place of understanding. So it's just like an in total type pivot. Everything's pivoting. Understanding's pivoting. Empathy is pivoting. Anger is pivoting. You know, you can't say anything to me. I do. I, I, I've learned how to check with respect. Okay. Okay. So, Okay. It's an entire pivot. Pivot, pivot, pivot. Pivot, pivot. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Um, Alonzo. I um so Alonzo's very humble, okay? I'm the old, I'm the old man in the group. <laughs> I'm not you're not old, you're you're wise. <laughs> and, well, I, I call that I call that uh, part of the part of the process. <laughs> I saved you for last because um you know that I've asked you about this, and I, I hope you I hope you really lean in on this question. But I your hit you have such a rich history, and I had known you for a long time and had no idea about your journey. Okay, and I think that your story is something that needs to be told to a broader audience. Um, so, but if you can kind of give us, you know. The Alonzo Davis 101, yeah, you know, and then I, yeah, I want everybody else on the panel to feel free to ask him questions as well, because there's a lot to learn from Alonzo. Well, I'm going to jump right into buoy. <laughs> I'm going to make a quantum leap. Okay, okay. We're talking about Black Lives Matter. Yes. And um, I, I, I signed up for an intern. And I thought and thought and thought about what is this intern going to do? And then I was assigned an intern and I looked at her, her interests, her background and so forth. And she's like, I'm an organizer. I was like, organizer. And then there's a little brother up the street, up, up, up the, you know, I've been living in a condo here in Hyattsville. And he's an architect, and his lady is into archival stuff. And, uh, you know, we interact. He's a young guy, just finished architecture school. And, um, wow, archival. So I'm going to assign Twyla Dixon 
who's at Bowie to work on my archives in okay. the studio. Okay, so we will get the story. <laughs> oh. So those archives really start 1967 when I opened Brockman Gallery in Los Angeles. And it was not the first gallery in Los Angeles, but it was probably the first commercial art gallery owned by two black people, my brother and I. And our focus was after the Watts riots or disturbance um, and to work with the artists of color, mostly black, but other minority uh, artists as well. And um, we began that whole journey of uh, presenting artists to a community. And we've had a whole series of these things happen around this country. We had the Harlem Renaissance and we had Afro Cobra and you know, that came out of Howard or, or was, is associated with Howard, it came out of Chicago. Um, and I'm in, in, emboldened by the movement of the young people now. And it's about continuation and not letting go. And so I'm not upset about this. I'm like, keep your foot on the gas pedal. We had too many, too many breaks in our process and we got such momentum going among majority and minority communities, not only in Wisconsin, not only in Minnesota, not only in Kentucky, not only in Georgia, but in Tokyo, mm -hmm. in Berlin. Absolutely, internationally. Internationally. Yep. And they all are not Black, but they feel the Black consciousness and they feel the movement. And in a way, Black Lives Matter is a term for a bigger picture. And we need to make sure that our young people, they got to carry it forward. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it becomes their journey uh, as, as we have had these experiences. My aunt was in, you know, in the, in the 20s and 30s, she was a, a suffragette from, you know, Birmingham, Alabama. And she, you know, I remember my dad talking about having to pay a poll tax to vote. You know, so. Um, Where's your dad from? Dad is from Washington, D.C., but I was born in Tuskegee, Alabama. So that's where the poll tax was. And later on, we moved to Los Angeles as uh, young people. Um, and we started our journey there and, uh, you know, uh, interacted with a uh, real interesting the black communist community in, in uh, Los Angeles. That's a deep community. Wow. And very, very, very active. Um, so um, I would say that, um, you know, thinking about this and thinking about, you know, Black Lives Matter is also uh, navigating social change, navigating earth, navigating climate, navigating Pan-Africanism, navigating the world peace. We're, we're all a part of it. And we cannot let ourselves be eliminated by a majority, um, what has been a majority population or way of thinking. And someone said to me about looting and um, you know, looting, if you really want to talk about looting, go to the British Museum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't talk about our streets, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it, it, we got some, we got, that's a lot of history and, and it's on both sides of the fence. Yes. And yeah. it, it, it can be a reaction. So any, um, that's um, my little piece. Um, oh, I did a piece. Yes. Uh, based on uh, a visit to Joe's Movement Emporium, okay. where the police spoke, and they all came in vests and packing. I'm looking around the room. I'm like, hey, this is supposed to be a friendly meeting, wow. a community meeting. And I roll up on a brother behind my studio in Mount Rainier, and I say, hey, man, that was a good, that was a good meeting, but I felt like I should have had on a vest, too. He rolled his eyes. And that was the beginning of a whole new series. 
Wow. So, but now I have a series of artworks of police vests that we can wear to protect oh. ourselves from them. Wow. Metaphor. And my most recent piece was in, um, was a performance piece uh, in Oakland, uh, honoring um, a guy named uh, Casper Banjo, who seemed to be homeless and was shot by the police. And Casper was an artist in our community. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a virus around this country yes. and uh, we have to attack it and inoculate it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's my, that's, that's where I'm at at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you all a general question. Um, you know, one of my favorites is Nina Simone. And she said that an artist's duty is to reflect the times. Um, but tell me what you think in general, the role um, of artists should be in social justice movements and um, how you think that plays out with people, not only in your work, but with artists that you work with and artists that you know and are pretty close to and that you follow. I think they should, I think that my, my role specifically, specifically is to make sure that they are able to get their truth out because everybody has a feeling about it. Some people, uh, now, if it's in direct, uh, if I have a problem with it, then, you know, I could always say no, you know, but I think that this is a time where people need to tell the truth, tell their stories, be seen, be heard, because that's the problem. People are not seen and they're not heard. And musically, music is, you know, that great universal communicative thread and you know it connects hearts sometimes maybe a melody will just trigger something that makes somebody soften something or just hear it mm -hmm. people need to be heard and be seen and if i can help in whatever i do to help somebody be seen be heard and to help get that message across then um that's a, a formidable role for me and and it's plenty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to weigh in? <laughs> Y'all not touching that one? Yeah, I have, no, I have, no, I got it. I had to um, unmute at the same time. I was like, hold up. Oh, okay. Um, so I do want to touch on that. I just want to make a point to say that, you know, I feel like, you know, our what we create brings awareness to situations. Like, for instance, you know, the new generation, they, they're not aware of the George Stennies or the, um, the um, Emmett Till's, you know, they only know the Trayvon Martins and the um, and the George Floyd's. So um, I know one artist, um, actually Luther Wright, created a piece about um, George Stenny, you know, who was the first and the youngest black male to be executed. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, that raised a conversation for me. I didn't know who he was and it made me, you know, I went on YouTube and found a documentary. Yeah, that, that picture, they have a picture of him that's been going around, he was, Yes. Yeah, he was 15 years old, like he was a child, and he was accused of killing two little white girls. But again, that's history that we forget about because, um, you know, because of the movement, which is, you know, a great thing. But I think um, a lot of times that people don't realize it's not just a, been a marathon. It's something that we've been dealing with for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I think art brings awareness to those situations. Okay. You know, we've got a couple of interesting institutions around the country. Um, uh, the, the museum in Memphis, where uh, King was uh, assassinated. Um, we've also got uh, the museum in uh, Montgomery. Uh, uh, and there's a the lynching museum. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, there's a lot going on for those that choose to be aware. Yes. And our, our role is to uh, keep that awareness in front of the public. Sometimes it's hard to embrace. I know, um, you know, I didn't want to go to the Memphis Museum uh, at first because I'm, I don't want to go angry. And um, I needed to go wide awake or be woke. But um, it took me, you know, it took me a year to kind of step into 
em embrace uh, that history that uh, we've lived through. Yeah, Joss? Yeah, so no, I just wanted to uh, respond to what Alonzo said. And I definitely wanted to thank him again as far as uh, embracing one of our, our students from Bowie State. And that's, that, that kind of leads me to my next point, which is you know really the importance of, of HBCUs and and the art programs at HBCUs, and 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 as as I'm stepping into this role of, of chair, you know, the first thing we've talked about is like, okay, what is our mission? What is our purpose? And I mean, we want to prepare our young people, obviously, but at the same time, we do want them to be, you know, politically conscious and socially conscious, environmentally conscious, right? Politically conscious, et cetera, et cetera. You, you quoted Nina Simone. I had I just instantly thought about James Baldwin, and I want to read this quote to you guys, which is one of my favorites, which is. All art is a kind of confession, more or less oblique. All artists, if they are to survive, are forced at last to tell the whole story, to vomit the anguish up. And I, I, that's one of my favorite quotes uh, from James. Just, you know, we really have to be honest. And that's what I love about kind of like what's happening with Black Lives Matter and even what we're seeing with our young people at Bowie State um, is that they, they're, they're speaking, they're, they're, they are demanding change. And it's not the same generation as mine or yours, right? Um, I mean, we've even been affected where someone came in I, even before, I think it was right before, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, drawing blanks here. But there was a, there was, we had some vandalism on our campus base, some racist vandalism. And we've even had one of our students, you know, killed, I think right when Trump got elected, one of our students was killed on the campus of, of, of College Park. So if, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is if, if we, you know, our, our young people are, are affected, whether they're out, out in the world or whether it comes to on campus and somebody spray paint some, some hatred on, on our campus. Um, but I think, I think the roles of, of, of colleges and universities are, are critically important in schools, but definitely HBCUs, we really have to continue the tradition, the great tradition of, of again, working with some of the great artists like Alonzo and, and Lisa and Ronya Lee, we're always, one thing I wanna do is have our art, our young artists connect with uh, artists that are here in the gateway and uh, whether it be through internships or apprenticeships because there's such uh, uh, so much that they can learn from all of you. So I just wanna continue that, that, that tradition of, you know, and that's the same tradition I came out of, you know, going to an HBC as well. So just making sure that, that we serve, we, that we're, we're doing art with a specific purpose um, and, and making sure that our young people uh, understand that it's not just about getting the degree, as I tell them all the time, it's what's the impact, what change are you gonna make? What contributions are you gonna make and how are you gonna empower your people? Definitely. Um, that leads me to um, another point about artist roles and responsibilities. I, um, as I'm sure you know, a lot of people have, and some of you probably have, I had gotten after the Black Lives Matter movement, has started to take hold. I got calls from um, some of my white friends that I grew up with. Um, there were also some artists here in the arts district who asked the question, how can I help, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, there, there's so much that you, ha you have to unpack even with that question, right? <laughs> um, but if everybody could kind of weigh in on what your experience with that is, um, I think in the name of bridge building, I land on the side of you should give instructions, you know, because um, if you don't know, you don't know. Um, but at the same time, you know, being a black woman born in 1966 in the South, you know, there's an exhaustion that I have around that, you know. So um, whoever wants to weigh in first, please do so. But I'd like for you all to kind of tell me about that with you. I'll jump in. Um... Much like Kiana's experience, slightly different. Um, I sort of joke with my white friends and my friends of color, like, you know, well, the one black child in the classroom um, for a long time, or like one of four or one of three. And all of the, the few black people that would be there would, you know, sort of come to me to be sort of this middle ground. And the white folks would come to me to sort of um, so sometimes I do get very exhausted, exhausted. But, have had, but have had a lot of experience doing that. And one of the things after this whole thing sort of rolled out and the rest of the world woke up, um, I offered time and energy to sort of do a reading slash discussion slash bridge building group between artists of color and white artists um, in the area. And there were a good group of us who met over the course of six weeks. We read Baldwin, we listened to Nina Simone, we talked about it, we, we watched 13th. Um, 
and not as if doing that was going to sort of check a box and then now the work was done, but as sort of an introduction to having the conversation um, and to the awareness. And what I've been trying to encourage uh, colleagues, uh, white colleagues and friends and, and acquaintances is to one, pace themselves um, and, and to two, find the reason to do it that goes beyond shame, that goes beyond um, pity, that goes beyond. That's an know, excellent point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like really try to try to find, get to a place, even if it feels selfish initially, like, oh, this is gonna affect my life too. Start in a place that where you can really center it so that you can be in it for the long haul. So that once all of this dies down, because I think at some point it might, it will, it does, that you've made this a part of your life, this quest for this understanding, and that it's not gonna happen in a couple of sessions and an anti-racism training and the next work you make. Like, <laughs> in my opinion, that you really have to sign up to engage in it kind of over the long haul as sort of the example we have in Alonzo and others, so. Anybody else? Um, so I just wanted to like touch on um, what Elise said about them knowing their privilege or being aware of their privilege. Um, you know, if I get the all lives matter situation, like I hear that a lot, you know, if you say black lives matter. And um, actually I quote, quote a coworker of mine and he said, just because we say save the whales don't mean we want the rest of the fish to die. So I think a lot of people aren't understanding that it's not about the fact that we're not saying that everybody else is not mad. And this opens up conversations with, um, you know, other races. I had a conversation with my neighbor, actually, and he was talking about how, you know, the police beat up everybody. And, <laughs> and his point was, you know, that he's gotten beat up too. So I actually, my, I told him, I said, the difference between that and what Black men go through is that you're living it. Yes. Um, so one of the things that um, one of the artists that that I spoke with, one of the white artists that I spoke with, um, talked about ways to build bridges um, with black artists. And one of the things that they suggested was collaborations. And so, you know, have you all, do you all collaborate a lot in, in you know, your practice? And um, if so, is that something you'd be interested in? Or do you find that something that's not gonna be fruitful? You know, tell me, um, let us know, you know, what that might look like. Um, I know I'm doing a lot of chime in here, but <laughs> um, I actually did do a collaboration with um, white artists. <laughs> Um, we actually, we took six pieces and literally rotated and everybody contributed to each piece. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I think that shows that there's some growth there. How'd you feel about it at the end? Um, I felt good. It was, it was, it was um, an experience, not just as a white, but just because, you know, you have all these artists of different backgrounds and different styles, you know, they all working on this one painting and it literally got rotated between seven people. And what happens is your piece gets rotated and it comes back to you at the end and you can make changes at the end. And it's funny how you start out with something like this. Mine was a little girl, little black girl with a book on the floor with ball, like a little ball of toys around her. And then by the time it came back, like her little, she had like a poof ball, poof ball was gone. It was like a, it was like a space scene. And then something was popping out the book, you know? So yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I do it again. Yeah, um, no, I definitely believe in collaboration and strategic partnerships. Um, I mentioned earlier when there was some vandalism uh, on Bowie's campus and one of our students, his name was Richard Collins, a student that was killed, Richard Collins III that was killed at University of Maryland's campus, um, stabbed, you know, by some, some white kid. Um, but, but I mentioned that because uh, the professors in our department, Professor Gina Lewis, Professor Jennifer White Johnson, uh, students from Bowie State got together with students from College Park and they ended up creating a unity mural um, that actually was on presentation at the, uh, the uh, State House in Annapolis. And so, yeah, we're, we're always trying to look for ways to collaborate. I mean, I, I've had a unique experience of, of going to an HBCU and then being on, like Aranya Lee said, being the only black student in all white program at grad schools at UNBC. So I've had both experiences and I've, I've built collab, you know, collaborative partnerships with 
professors of all of all races at both institutions. But I think, yeah, I just think I, I just say sincerity is the most important thing. Um, this shouldn't be a one off like, you know, if people are truly, truly sincere, um, then th then I'm all for it. And yes, my, my phone, I was, I was telling Michelle, my, my phone has been ringing up off the hook a little bit. A lot of studios are reaching out to Bowie State, you know, that haven't called before. We've had some some big names kind of call us. Uh, and I'm like, OK, this didn't happen a few years ago. Thank you, Black Lives Matter. But um, as long as it's sincere and it's sustainable and people are really trying to do that, I mean, trying to to make change. Um, we're all about, you know, collab collaboration. So absolutely. And then and even in my own work, um, I certainly uh, will collaborate with with folks, help, you know, hopefully here in the gateway and and those who are, who are true to it, who really believe in what they and who really want to see change. And this is, again, not just a one time thing. And we forget about it in a couple of years. And um, we actually during the murals that we've been creating for Black Lives Matter, there's actually white artists that are doing murals for Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. about that. Powerful pieces too. Yeah, one of the um, one of my favorite. It's not a mural, but um, it's a projection installation. The um, Dustin Klein, I think, is the artist's name in Richmond, um, where he yes, where he projected George Floyd's face on the Robert E. Lee statue, and um, I could not stop looking at it. I found it haunting, um, and I think that a lot of people felt that way about it because this was in you know, when everybody was trying to get all the statues taken down. Um, and so, you know, while I am certainly in favor of that, um, because I believe that symbols matter, um, that transformed that statue into something else that was meaningful for me and touched me and changed me. So, um, yes, there are a lot of, there's a lot of that going on too as well. White artists are doing other projects as well. Anybody else um, have any collaboration? Yeah, I was just... Many of just gonna... projects are collaborative. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Alonzo. It's okay. I'll go after you. It's fine. <laughs> Actually, we should touch base because what you do overlaps something that I might like to collaborate with you on. So, um, you know, let's talk about collaboration. Let's let's make this connection a connection. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's up to me and you to do the follow up. But, yeah, I'm gonna follow up. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. I was actually just going to put in a plug because I am a multimedia artist, but with my main focus is dance and dance often gets left out <laughs> because I think people sometimes don't know what, what to do with it. Um, but yeah, I would love, that was kind of what I was going to say is just, I would love to collaborate um, sure. starting with folks on this call. And I'll also quickly say, I think I, I really second that idea of sincerity, how that's important. Um, and what I've been encouraging sort of uh, white artists who have reached out to me is, you know, what might it look like for us to really, really collaborate? Because I think we use the word collaborate a lot. And mm -hmm. I will say I've been guilty of it, too, where just because we're both sitting in the room together and you're doing your film part and I'm doing my dance part <laughs> and we make a thing doesn't mean we really collaborated. So I think I would love to continue uh, the practice of collaborating. Uh, so I can get better at it. I just wanted to add one real quick piece, the sincerity. It's going to tag onto that beautifully. My word was organic. You know, I don't want to just do it just because we are, you know, let's try and do this. Let's try and get together and do a collab for what? Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, what is your intention? Mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine owns a sign sign company. And, you know, she's been selling those Black Lives Matter signs and all love is proper love. And she's, you know, people are buying them for the neighborhoods. And she was like, um, I feel like I want to have some responsibility and, and a learning attached to it. Mm -hmm. And so she did that. And it's I guess it's working in some ways. But I thought that was brilliant that a sign company owned by a black woman is just like, you're not just going to buy this sign and just put it in, in your front yard and think that's going to be cool enough, mm -hmm. but there's work behind it, even if it's a little bit. And I think this is the same thing with collaboration. I've done, I'm, all, I'm always collaborating, but I've collaborated with um, people who wanted to do things that are specifically uh, geared to black causes, Juneteenth specifically. And, um, because I know those people who are not black, I, I, I know that deep in their hearts, they want to do the right thing. 
But I think part of what I did was know that at some point I'm going to have to say more than, okay, I'll help. Um, it's time to kind of, you know, give bits of education so that they can take something more away than a completed project. I agree with you. Um, transformation is the word that is big for me. Um, you know, and for that, you know, you have to open yourself up. This this process should open your heart and your mind. And and um, the truth of the matter is, is that, you, you know, change comes because there's something that people have to let go of, something has to die. And at the end of the day, those are the hard conversations that, you know, we are really not having still, you know, but um, with some of my white friends, that's, that's the conversation that I'm pushing, you know, these things have to lead to transformation, not just new information for you. So, um, so I want to, I want to, so at the Gateway Media Arts Lab, which you all are very familiar with, um, we focus on um, supporting artists as business owners, okay? Um, cause you know, there's nothing that we can teach you all are the experts at filmmaking and music production, et cetera, dancing. But, um, I want to, I want you all to tell me how we can help you in this process. What would that look like? Not just the lab, but D part 3311, which is, um, our partner program. Um, and, uh, the parent organizations are the gateway community development corporation, as well as the Prince George's arts and humanities council. How do we move this Black Lives Matter effort forward in the artist community? What would that look like for you all? I don't know. <laughs> it's too many <laughs> white, too many bright, too many, too many irons in the fire. That's a that question that gives me indigestion almost, you know. Okay, really? <laughs> we want look, how, how can we help, right? So <laughs> but all of but all of all of what you put into it uh -huh. is could we help, but all of that other entities, it, it makes it pretty complicated. Um, you find, um so maybe, maybe we, you can define how you would like to approach us. Okay, and, okay. And okay. Um you know, it's it's um, and it's not an easy step. It's not an easy step. Well, that's a conversation, though, Alonzo. You know, maybe we should take a moment to to say something about that because um, our elected officials, government entities, you know, everybody goes after the funding, and you know, there's the feeling on the ground that a lot of times it's way more complicated than it should be. Okay. <laughs> um, so if that's the truth, then, you know, maybe we need to say that. Well, you know, who, who is it? Um, it was the French artist. Um, um, he accepts no funding. Mm. Mm. He goes after his own funding and is private. Okay, okay. Oh, wow. wow. This guy, you know. Yeah. Um, and so... You know, I mean, I've sat on a lot of boards. I've been involved in a lot of nonprofit organizations and so forth. But I mean, I own a studio in Kentucky for, for visiting artists and I charge. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have a board. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be raising money. I just want people to have a good space where they can create and work either collaboratively or selfishly mm -hmm. and, uh, and move forward in that, in that way. Um, I also want to make a shout out to uh, the international community because, you know, um, this is, you know, this, this Black Arts movement is global and um, uh, we have to think global mm -hmm. and act local. Mm -hmm. And that, that has stuck with me since the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Think global, act local. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh. I, I know we're not at the end, but I, I got to put this sign up because it's become my mantra. What is that? A particular period of time. 86, 45, <laughs> 11, 3, 20. That is you encouraging us to vote. <laughs> it's time. Yes. <laughs> Don't ignore it. 
<laughs> Thank you, Renan Alonzo. Can, can I hop in here, Michelle? Sure. Okay, and I'm, I'm seeing this nice post from, uh, thank you, Maria Fenton. Uh, yes. <laughs> continuing to provide a platform uh, for artists. So, you know, my, my, my uh, uh, sort of uh, ulterior motives is always going to be film and <laughs> media production here in Prince George's County. And I'm glad Elise is here and, and we've got, uh, you know, Creative Edge uh, Collaborative and all the support from PG Arts and Humanities Council, the PG Film Office. So, and there's been a lot of wonderful things happening um, here in Prince George's County as it relates to film production, media production. Um, and so uh, you at all as the Gateway Media Arts Lab have really been, uh, and, and, and PG Arts Humanities Council and Gateway CDC have been really instrumental in connecting me with uh, film, some filmmakers. Uh, I mentioned um, um, Tressa Smallwood, who's a, a wonderful producer. Actually, she's shooting a film right now as we speak, uh, right here in Prince George's County. Our students are working on it. Um, I've worked on one of her films that actually is premiering in ABFF this weekend called The Available Wife. It's happening now at the same time as a Gateway Open Studio Tour. So I'm always looking for, I think, Michelle, we talked about creating this, this niche or this hub here in the Gateway for filmmakers, for producers, for animators, motion graphic designers, so a place that they could, uh, you know, start create, look for funding in terms of film and media projects, also distribution, and also tools for creating. Um, and then I see, and definitely with um, with Design Park 3311, I didn't mention we we teach fashion and costume design at Bowie State, and so costume design and wardrobe is equally going to be uh, uh, important as well. So I, I just I would really love to just continue to work with you all to really establish if it's in the Gateway or some other part of the county. Um, a place th that filmmakers, c c you know, and, and, and film producers and writers can uh, get work done, get funding, get, get um, finish their films and things like that. Uh, we don't really have that right here uh, in, in the county. And so uh, I'm looking for those, those types of, uh, you know, just kind of technical thing, technical spaces to create work um, and get work produced. And then, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll see if, if anyone else any, has anything else to share. Okay. Um, I think I think a good idea would be to have some type of a meet and greet because, um, you know, I was blessed to again be net connected and networked through you know Gateway CDC as far as far as well as the Media Arts Lab because I have um, the DMV League of Artists and we're incubated out of the Media Arts Lab. So with that, um, you know, I linked up with Teodros and the Available Wife. The DMV League has <laughs> provided the artwork for the movie. So we're excited about that. <laughs> so um, those are the type of connections I have. But then, you know, now we're on this panel, like I've never met Alonzo, Vanya, or a piece. So, you know, those are people that maybe we can um, meet if we had different meeting rates that maybe we can network and kind of elaborate, and, you know, have a for each other. That would be great. Um, anybody else on that point? If not, at least I want to go back to you because um, I don't think you mentioned it when we talked earlier. I want to talk. Are you smiling because you know what I'm going to ask? <laughs> I wanted to talk about the Recording Academy. And um, you, yeah, you know what I'm getting ready to ask. You want to talk about that a bit? You're on mute. Well, what you want me to talk about? Um, um, you talked about, was it a diversity program? Well, uh, we just uh got a new uh in diver diversity and inclusion head at the Rec recording academy her name is Valicia Butterfield Jones and uh basically you know because of the times and all of the development of specifically people of diverse backgrounds we needed to make sure that they were being uh, seen and counted more properly and uplift them a little in a more strong manner. And uh, we got Valicia and uh, she's going to lead that charge. And you can expect to see a lot of things uh, look a little different, feel a little different from the academy. Um, specifically in our, in our chapter, we've created a uh, social impact committee that uh, speaks to those kinds of things specifically. Uh, one of our members, Tamara Wellens, who you all know well, uh, was one of those people who definitely thought that we should be attaching social impact with advocacy. Um, it, you know, the Recording Academy is an advocacy uh, group. So while we have adv advocacy and while we have social impact, tying that together, uh, creates a more powerful uh, uh, 
responsibility to make sure that everybody's needs are met, everybody's concerns are heard, everybody, we are at least making the effort to make sure that people are not um, dismissed and uh, things are happening the way they should for everyone, for everyone who is a member. So um, that's that's what that's about in a in a big nutshell. You know, this is not specifics. I don't have specifics. Everything's so very new. But understanding that this is all happening right now, uh, there's definitely a lot of pinpoints. You know, I know that the Academy pointed people towards organizations to support uh, people who were protesting and people who were raising money for Breonna Taylor and Amon Arbery and all of those things. So there are definitely people who things are being connected, a uh, spider web of connection of supporting people who need the support. So we, it's almost time for us to wrap up. We've got about, uh, we've got about four or five minutes. So everybody in less than one minute, um, tell us, um, you know, give us, you know, kind of a summary of uh, and what the takeaways you think should be from your perspective and, and what you would like to see different next year this time as a result of Black Lives Matter. Well, I hope there's a cure for this COVID-19 and we can be in the same room and space together because I, I want to collaborate with everybody here. And uh, I'm, I'm sitting here like, like Ronya, aunt, was what Ronya Lee, I was, I was like, oh, dance. Oh, yes, yes. Anyway, um, I'm all down, my sister. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a, 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 a kind of a sci-fi script right now that deals a lot of the issues that we talked about today from the environment to police brutality. And, and I'm hoping to get that produced, you know, in the next couple of years or so. But but again, to um, continue to collect, to have opportunities like this. Uh, whether it be virtual or in person, we'll, we'll pray. Um, but I think, you know, these types of, of, of events are, are really meaningful. And again, I, I even would like to sort of extend this to, to some of the younger, younger artists, be they college, high school, you know, elementary school, et, et cetera, making sure we're, we're reaching back to that generation. So they'll, they'll continue this work for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, whatever we can do in the future to kind of as, as a follow up for this, I would be more interested or maybe there's a, a Black Lives Matter interactive dance film performance. I don't know. I'll put it out there. But I'm, I'm, I'm all for collaboration. And, um, you know, you all just let me know the, the next event. Um, I'm going to say that um, UCLA produced some really strong black filmmakers. Um, and uh, I used to exhibit their work uh, in the Brockman Gallery Film Festival uh, in the uh, early 70s. Uh, ben Caldwell, um, Julie Dash, um, uh, the guy from Howard, I, I, his name escapes me right now, um, Larry Clark. It's a, it's a, so that, that energy is still there for you to connect with and for me to help you reach them should you need that bridge. So in, in a way, that's a, a bridge, not a collaboration, but um, it that's makes a big difference. And uh, it gives your students a history of, um, uh, of this not just being a new effort, but, uh, but something to build on. Thank you. I'll take it, Alonzo. All right, we'll make it happen. <laughs> Who's next? I can go next. Um, I just want to say, let's you know, let's stop talking about it. Let's be about it. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of talk and no actions. Um, I just want to say also that you know we need to continue to provide opportunities for artists and the arts. Um, I did forget to mention that you know um, through Gateway and the Media Arts Lab and you know my collaboration with or partnership with Teodros for providing art. Um, we also, the NB League of Artists took the collective to Miami for Art Basel. We showed at Spectrum Gallery, which is one of the leading galleries in Miami. We were the first black collective to do that. So if we continue to support each other, oh, and I'm sorry, we partnered with Arts and Humanities. I want to mention that. Yeah, I was going to say shame. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> If we continue to support each other, I feel like we all can grow. Like as Michelle calls it, you know, us um, like we incubate each other. What was it? It's a, um, what's your words? I forgot. I'm sorry. I'm having a moment. What? I know. I'm um, like, <laughs> um, ecosystem. Ecosystem. Yes. Yeah. We're an ecosystem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let's continue to create an ecosystem. Yes. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll piggyback on that. I think that's great. I've been reading this uh, work, Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. And she talks a lot about oak trees and how oak trees are rooted in such a way that all the roots are connected so that you can't topple those trees. And I think a lot of our work, it's like we work sort of in silos. <laughs> Um, and the more that we can really connect with each other, I think the stronger the movement becomes in the work we do. So that's one big takeaway. Uh, and another takeaway is that, you know, we are continuing to do the work. Like it's just always encouraging to be with other folks who are really serious about what they're doing. Um, so yes, thank you. I'll just say, use the, use the resources that we have and um, be active with it. Um, just know the resources, use them, go ahead, make the phone call, follow up, use it and do it and, and just throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. And if it doesn't stick, do another one. Just keep doing it and just use the resources because right now everybody's throwing resources at us. People, friends, money, whatever, use it and just keep pushing. Elise, she said one thing that I think is so important, and that is that key word of follow-up. We have a lot of good ideas, but the follow-up and the follow-through is probably the hardest. And, um, but that's what makes it happen. I want to thank you all. Um, this has been a great discussion. Um, you know, I usually don't say this, but I, you know, I'm like, we should do this again, <laughs> right? Um, uh, I would love to have a chat um, later on. And there are some, a couple of other artists I know who I think uh, uh, wanted to join in on the discussion, but we had to, you know, we had to kind of narrow the field for time's sake. Um, but I think this is something that we could continue, we should continue as a follow-up. I think Kiana, um, please correct me if I'm wrong. I think we were looking at having you conduct a Q&A. Are we ready for that or? Um, we're ready, but we have to see if we have any questions. Okay. We're just going to wait to see if anyone. Oh, well, well, while we're waiting, I just want to say, too, um, you know, piggyback on what you were saying, like, let's not wait till someone dies to start standing. Yeah. Yeah. We can still continue to march, we can still continue to protest, we can still have our voices heard, and we do not have to wait for someone to die to do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, I will so throw out um, a few names of artists that are around the country that um, have come through my tutelage, so to speak. Uh, Vitus Shell in uh, Louisiana, uh, Michael Coppich in uh, Cincinnati, uh, Caleb Byers in Japan. Um, then right in the neighborhood is uh, Wason Jones and uh, Martha Jackson Jarvis. These are all strong artists and they're all active and um, make a difference. And Martha is here in the Gateway Arts District. That's correct. So is Wason. So Kian, I did see okay. one. Yeah. Uh, I'll hand it over to you, okay? Okay, so um, what's next in the art world for Black Lives Matter? You want to take that one? It seems that it's ongoing. I mean, I see something every day. I don't know about anything specific, but it seems like um, murals are getting funded um, all over the country. Artists are getting funded to do these things, but you know, I don't know all of the intention. I don't know all of the specifics, but it just seems like it's ongoing. I would, I would say that I think what, what might be next is, and this is tricky, is for artists to, and I think some of them are already doing it, but, but to begin or to learn how to really leverage this time in this space. So for instance, the example that Elise gave about the friend who's like, I'm not just gonna sell you lawn signs. <laughs> you know, you're gonna have to do this other step. And so what it looks like to say, you know, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and what might it look like for us, you know, another part of this opportunity to be interfacing with students at an HBCU, 
And, and, I, and I think that's going to take a lot of courage, but I think artists have to be willing to, okay, you want to fund me to do this, and here's how I can sort of push this forward to do something other than I did the mural or I did the dance or I did the play, you know, yay me, I got the check and it was, you know, on black stuff and I'm gone. How do we help, how do we hold these organizations accountable and really say, okay, I, I need more kind of leverage. Okay, um, we have another question. It's, um, how does changes in technology make it easier or harder to get more equitable playing field for artists? I'll uh, ask again, how does changes in technology make it easier or harder to get more equitable playing field for artists? Well, um, I would say obviously the, the tools that are available now for folks to produce things that would take forever back in the day, make it a lot, lot simpler. Um, especially given the, 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 the kind of where we are right now. Uh, at least I know it works in, in television production and, and film production. And so, whereas uh, a lot of studios have, have kind of shut down or went on hiatus, I, I know for folks doing kind of, you know, what I do like motion graphics and animation, you know, it's, it's, it's actually been great <laughs> because, you know, it, we, we, can, we can work from home now. And so it's really enabled us to do a lot more. Uh, but at the same time, um, you can have all, like I always tell my students, you can have all this great animation film content, but then how do you get it out there? How do you distribute it? So I think that's still going to be a challenge in terms of the distribution, in terms of the marketing of this content and, and, and products, and then making it sustainable, making it you know profitable. Um, that, that's always going to be a challenge because if everybody's homing on the internet, then everybody is homing on the internet, so to speak. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously, um, technology uh, can, and, can in, empower us and, and is making it a lot, make it a lot easier, as I mentioned. Um, but I still think we have some, some, we still have some of the, 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 the kind of like the gatekeepers in terms of getting our work out there on, in terms of mass distribution, whether it be film or art or music or what have you. So those things haven't changed, right? So that, that's probably where uh, technology has somewhat, I mean, it's great, but there's some limit, limitations. I think technology is really, it's wonderful and tricky. I think I'm back to that word pivot again. Uh, I think that the techies are out here trying to create ways where we can have something that looks good and sounds good. We have we started with Zoom and Zoom had its limitations. Zoom is pivoting. Zoom is Im improving while we speak. Um, they're trying to make it so we don't have to leave our basements, our living rooms, our sunrooms. Um, and so now I think that this kind of, you know, I'm always kind of the geeky techno geeko babble and I'm just like, all right, so what is tech, what is, um, what is telecom going to do when everybody's online, you know, because we've got big files, we have to send big files. We're talking about having dedicated lines to our house, T1 lines, so that we can just not compete with everybody in the neighborhood with the internet. Um, I've had all of those conversations. Um, how does it make us, what, how does it make it easy? It makes it wonderfully easy for me to, you know, in techie world, sh shade cameras that are on, that, you know, from the basement. I'm, I'm happy as a lark with some <laughs> of this stuff, you know, but at the other, on the other hand, you know, a film festival on on zoom or hop in or something it's not the same i miss people i miss sitting next to people and hearing them go mm, you see that yeah. I, miss, I miss that so i think that makes it you know the whole lack of being around people is is the worst of it all but i think that technology is helping us get through what we're getting through but we're going to be ready to run to a theater as soon as we can um I, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's my my take. I'm I'm loving music, but I'm missing live music. Yes, <laughs> yes. Like we can see it. People are doing it. People are trying their best to put a, put live concerts in safe spaces. I've worked on some. It's great, but when you can always. You know, squirrel, something over there is, you know, you're not paying attention, <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> so it's hard, but I, I can't wait to be amongst people again. Okay, so um, I actually have a question. How do you all feel about the defacing of the statues? You know, the statues are actually art, so we're like destroying someone's art. How, like, how do you feel about that? I'm I'm a victim. I've had so many murals uh, painted over that uh, I've embraced the fact that it's a temporary art form, and um, I've gone back and restored it and come back again, it changed again. Wow. And if the neighborhood changes, it changes. Sometimes my statement isn't the statement of the Latinx community that's moved into my ex community. And they need to have an opportunity to have their own voice as well. So, you know, I, I think in some cases, the record is the documentation and not the, um, uh, the object continuing uh, to have uh, infinity in terms of life. Alonzo, can I ask you something? Yeah, be careful. I, oh, this, this is deep. You just triggered something. I worked on a documentary about uh, gentrification. And one mm -hmm. of the things that came up is that, you know, people love to come to these areas where there's so many things that show the culture of the people who are there. And then you move into the neighborhood and their culture becomes a, a backdrop. It becomes, I, I called it uh, wallpaper. And as soon as they get in there and they're tired of the wallpaper, they want to change the wallpaper. Well, it's not wallpaper, it's culture. Mm -hmm. So. Robert E. Lee stands, yeah. but we've imposed an, an image on it. Mm -hmm. I had a, you know, a gentrification issue um, with a family home and in Los Angeles. And my brother's daughter was like, ah, we want to move. And I'm like, no, you don't. Just pay your taxes. Is your property is your property is gonna increase as as these other entities move into the one, they one it was white flight, then black people moved in and now white people are moving back in. It's okay. But you know, that little $30,000 house is worth $500,000 now and it'll be a million dollars later. And uh, if you don't pay your taxes, you're not controlling your, 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 your property. I mean, boy, when I had a studio in Baltimore and saw all of those properties go down, I was like, wow, what's happening? Well, no jobs for, you know, two generations and, um, the guy's just sitting on the stoop with a bottle or a, 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 a smoke and not paying for, you know, the, the, the right to be there, not, not maintaining their property. Part of the burden is on us. We've got to uh, take, you know, take that responsibility and control our, um, our neighborhoods. If not, um, it's going to change uh, and it keeps changing. Um, you know, that's why they have archaeologists digging up what cultures were 50, 100, 2,000 years ago. Oh, this little bottle is from uh, the Benin people. Well, wow. <laughs> you know, why, why wasn't it maintained? Why doesn't it, you know, why does it have to go down under when we can continue to keep it? So, uh, you know, part of it is on us. Um, and, uh, you know, in many ways, we control our own destiny. I was going to say there's, there's art and then there's symbol, symbols and symbolism, right? And, uh, you know, with all of these symbols, as I call them, <laughs> I don't know if I would cate categorize, uh, categorize all of them as art, but who created these symbols and, you know, uh, where, like you mentioned, uh, Brother Alonzo, I mean, what about the, the Native peoples and where, where were their original symbols and art that was destroyed and, and stolen and somewhere buried in someone's museum? So uh, yeah, I think what's happening in America right now is is uh, there's this this un this unpeeling of layers of of racism and white supremacy and patriarchy and and sexism and every other ism you can think of, and things are just rising to the top. So again, um, I I I, look, I think the artists are are kind of the antithesis to that. You know, we're we're here to kind of retell the 
the other story, so to speak, that has not been told or a people's history of, of the United States of America, so to speak. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's something that, that I, I'm always exploring in terms of, especially right we're in D next to DC, the capital of all symbols and monuments and <laughs> but where, is, where, are, where are our monuments as people of color? You know, where are our symbols? Um, and where is our artwork? And so I think the gateway, we, we can we can hopefully change some of that. <laughs> Well, Gateway has a has a has a responsibility in a way of documenting, mm -hmm. and if it's not documented, it didn't happen for many people, and uh, that that's true of our history. <clears throat> Next question: um, What do you like about the Gateway Arts District? I will say it's a beehive a beehive of energy, of uh, creative peoples, of all walks of life, choices of life, genders, um, races, et cetera. And um, uh, I'm enjoying, you know, I'm enjoying this community in terms of uh, what it brings in terms of creative energy. Um, and it's grown. I, I arrived here in 2002, and um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's taken a bit of time, but um, it's grown by leaps and bounds. Okay. Um, how do we, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, just everything he said, and just, just community. I think we, we just got to get back to that, you know, just the real community. community, real simple and plain. Yeah. How do we take advantage of the period created by the Black Lives Matter movement in a manner that is lasting? No one? I'll read it again. How do we take advantage of the period created by the Black Lives Matter movement in a manner that is lasting? So how do we keep this thing going? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll jump in again, because I always want to say, you know, we, we can always be the no offense to everybody, but we can always be the old heads talking, right? I think really making sure we're connecting to the young folks, um, whatever level that may be, you know, um, at the college level, elementary, high school, you know, just really hoping that this community, as I mentioned earlier, is sustainable. And so uh, that's the only way it's going to continue, just like the the elders and the mentors that I, I, I who showed us I stand on. Um, wouldn't want, I think that's going to be the key. And uh, however, we as a community of artists can really make sure that we're reaching out to the youth here in Prince George's County uh, to really continue that. I think that's going to be the key for any any movement, Black Lives Matter, or any other. I, I had said a little earlier, and this ties right in with what you're saying, is that we've got to encourage young people not to take their foot off the gas. We've got to be persistent, and and this part of our obligation, in a way, is to encourage them to continue. Uh, and to give them whatever they need uh, to feed that uh, force and voice. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll have a gap and we'll have another revolution again. But this could be continuous. And, it, and because we've got a worldwide movement right now, uh, we, we need to make sure it doesn't stop. And we have to feed it. Yeah, I want to, yes, everything that's already been said. I also think it's important, um, I can't remember who brought up this idea of symbols, and I think symbols are very important, but I think just just in my, in my world and experience of things, that we often get really caught up on symbols, and then there isn't the substance behind it. So really connecting with young people, but helping them to go beyond, um, and all of us to go beyond, you know, I've got a fist on my t-shirt you know, or I have this particular hashtag, or I'm woke, you know, that's great. But what, you know, what does that really mean? And, you know, I think we have to remember, too, that so many of the young leaders that we had, you know, um, in, the, in, in the sort of beginnings of the civil rights movement, kind of the first time around, or the first iteration, they were so young, but they were so well educated and by educated, I don't mean like, you know, went to school and got degrees. I mean, they they had read 
important and seminal texts and really thought about these things. And, and so I think any way that we can get James Baldwin, Nina Simone, Stokely Carmichael, uh, you know, uh, Bell Hooks, any way that we can get pieces of those, that information to young people to hold on to, to anchor themselves in, I think we're going to find ourselves in a better position once we stop making the t-shirts. Um, I agree, um, but there's only going to be a few leaders. We need to identify who, the, who, who those are so they can carry forward. Um, it's, everybody's going to do the hashtag and the CC and the, um, you know, those are all fun, you know, things to have, but there's somebody out there that is going to take the mantle. And those are the people that we have to uh, embrace and encourage. You know, I, I heard Stokely Carmichael. Well, who, 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 who fed Stokely? Who brought him into a leadership position? Um, the, you know, King was a, a very unspoken person until he hit Alabama. Uh, Malcolm X was in prison. Look, look, look at the power that he brought to our country. Mm -hmm. um, so you know we've got all of those historicals, but but there's a there's a, a vast number of young people that we may not have identified that we should look forward to, whether they're in college or not in college, whether they're incarcerated or um, out and un unidentified, they're there. They're they're trying to make a way, um, and there's so many vehicles now for 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 voices in terms of Facebook and, and uh, Instagram and uh, et cetera. I mean, even, even, some of the, even some of the little film clips on uh, TikTok, oh my God, unreal. We, but who, who, who in there, you know, the young lady who is uh, making a marking of, of, of Mr. Trump, oh my God, her work is really good. So, um, you know, we need to follow those kind of energies and people to um, to help us make that next step, and and they can identify other young people. Um, so it's about empowerment. And I would just say to create, create, create. Don't stop. Everybody, continue to do what they've always been doing. Um, and it's so fun, f funny that this might be corny. But uh, I think at least one person on this panel will like what I'm about to say. I think that we have a responsibility to continue to do it as a service. And this hit me. It's the refrain from our alma mater, Hampton. Oh, Hampton, we never can make thee a song. Except as our lives do the singing. <laughs> and service that will, will thy great spirit prolong and send it through the centuries centuries ringing so we still have to keep doing it keep doing it um another question is there a gateway media arts prince george's arts and humanities resource list page where we can connect specialists within our I'll take that one. I think um, the the plan um, has been, and certainly um, from this point forward, is to have the Open Studios Tour website be that resource so that it'll have the links to all of the artists, not only the artists that participate, but other artists in the Arts District as well that may not have been a part of um, this session. And maybe that can be added to the Gateway Art Beat absolutely yes we have the app too oh yeah, forgive me yeah, yeah. right <laughs> um, <the game. laughs> i know jelly geo yeah we've been working with pierre and samuel on an app um gateway art beat which is wonderful um and so if you haven't um heard about that yet uh we'll make sure that that we get that out there because everybody should download it so um i actually have a question how do you feel that the Black Lives Matter movement compares to the civil rights movement? And how do you feel that social media has impacted the Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, 
I hate to keep talking, but it's a continuation. Uh, it's a change of name, but it's a continuation from my vantage point. It was, 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 it, the fight and the struggle is, is the same in different names. Along, along those same lines, what I think is kind of interesting um, is that some of, some of the most pivotal moments in the civil rights movement were uh, video. Like when, when something was shown on television, um, when, you know, when people saw dogs and hoses and that sort of thing, then America sort of goes, yeah. Um, and so ironically, in the same sort of way with the Black Lives Matter movement, increase levels of the use of technology to, to again, show people, here's what's happening. Um, here's someone being tased in their car who's not doing anything. Uh, so it's just interesting to see that it's, it feels like it's worlds apart in terms of time, but some of the similar mediums are being used to kind of sound the alarm. Yeah, I, I agree with what you just said. Um, definitely it's continuation the the use of technology and film, powerful. Um, I'm going to always come back to, um, it, it's just circle back to youth and students and HBCUs that y'all plug in. Hampton, I have to throw in my Morgan State University love, it's all good. But no, but how pivotal HBCUs were with all of these movements, right? And how pivotal young people and students are uh, th that led the protest, whether it's here or in South Africa, right? There's always usually been students or the church or an HBCU. And so I think just, just getting folks to really understand uh, the power supporting our, our churches, our, our organizations, our HBCUs all, all across the US and really letting our young people know, like you, you all have the power. I tell my students every day. It was the students, you know. It was the students, you know. What we just uh, uh, mourn the loss of, of of John Lewis, who just passed. And you know, again, as a young organizer and all the other young organizers with for CLC, CLC and uh, Black, you know, Black Panther Party, etc. So just getting young people to realize the power of that that students and young people have, because it really it really started with them, and it really can kind of continue with them. So. But it is a continuation. I don't see. I don't see what happened 60 years, 100 years ago, or 400 years ago. Is it's the same continuation, same struggle. Um, and I just really wanted to touch real quick. I know I keep going back to, um, you know, the, the past, but you know, we had situations where Emmett Till's mother, you know, had his mm -hmm. casket open so we could see the torture, and it was posted in a newspaper. Nowadays, we have social media, and we can watch George Floyd die. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. so and, um, and oh, I was sorry. gonna say just real, real quick about that, just before I forget, just unfortunately there was a, there's a mural, no, there was a big poster of, of Breonna Taylor that was vandalized recently. So I just, it, it made me think about what they do, they're doing in Mattel's image as well as, you know, others, so. Okay, so another question is, um, favorite black owned business? Um, my business but look, besides your, I was going to say besides your own <laughs> mine. mine 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 no I think you know all of them that, that that serve me that serve us responsibly with fervor um, there's a coffee shop up the street uh, owned by Miss Veronica Cooper it's called Culture Coffee 2 she is just trying to make sure that everybody is engaging with everybody. I mean, it's a neighborhood that's changing and um, she is right there. She wants everybody to, to know each other, to feel each other, to give, give, give and, um, and support each other. So now she's got more things in her, in her place. Um, I love what Angel is doing over at the Spice Suite. Um, she's pivoting from being in her place to actually selling things outside, uh, uh, mailing, mail order, um, the water hole over in Mount Rainier. Um, yeah, I mean, the people who are out here trying to make it happen and trying to keep people healthy and fed and, and, and all of that. So those are just, that's just three. I, there are so many. I want to give a um, shout out to um, Ben's Chili Bowl on that note, because Ben's has held it down for years. You talk about social responsibility. 
um, and a sense of purpose. And they, you know, uh, to use your term, Elise, have pivoted to Ben's Next Door. So they've been able to keep them both going. And, you know, just to have um, that legacy is a big deal in the Black community, you know, where you've been able to span generations of a family. So um, had to give a shout out to Ben's. Well, I'm, I'm going to throw out, I, I, of course, I got to give love to my, my sister, Nisi. Uh, yes, Nisi Boutique. Nisi. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, I've had many, many conversations and wisdom and love to my sister there. And, and again, all in water, watering hall as well. I've, I'm going I'm to drive on down to D.C. I was trying to say in Prince George's County, but if I drive to D.C., I got to give love to uh, Sankofa and uh, Baba Holly Green and Shrikiana, who are my, my, my mentors in, in, in cinema, so to speak. And how many uh, great, great folks have come through Sankofa uh, right there on Georgia Avenue. So, but uh, yeah, there's, there's many. I'm going to give a shout out to my um, collectives here. So we have DMV League of Arts, um, LW Arts and Design, um, Luther Wright, um, Art Bay, Michael Carey, Black Art Today, Lisa and Alicia Clark. I want to give them a fair shout out. Oh, okay. So actually, um, I just want to kind of close it a little bit with everyone talking about their own businesses. How about that? <laughs> so we'll all take a moment to talk about what we do, what our business kind of your own little plug commercial. So we'll start with Teodro. All right, well, Visual Jazz uh, is a uh, film media collective. We focus in um, film, animation, motion graphics, projection design, uh, now production design, which is a new thing for me. <laughs> and um, really, it's, it's a collaborative of, of filmmakers, artists uh, here in, the, in Prince George's County. And um, yeah, but what's all about just using video and film to empower and, um, and strengthen people and create narratives that, that are not there specifically in terms of, of narrative film, uh, animation, and hopefully more. I'm, uh, my studio is Blue Door Studios in Mount Rainier and uh, shared with uh, Alex Simpson. And uh, we have a number of young people that come through as interns or, uh, or those that are looking to collaborate on different projects. And it is, um, uh, you know, private business. Art Media is me and all the things that I do. I do music production, I do film production and direction, uh, TV production and directing. Um, I do pretty much a lot of consulting with other people who do that. It's all changing. Technology is is king right now and I'm managing it very, very well. And I think that the special thing about me is that I've done a lot of everything. Uh, you know, I've done everything in the in, in entire the production. So me leading it with finesse and folding in finesse is I think the special sauce. So here I am. So by Rania, essentially the same uh, setup that Elise shared, sort of me and the work that I'm doing as a multimedia artist uh, with dance and singing, songwriting, and uh, playwriting as well. Uh, and really just creating by any medium necessary and in the midst of doing all of that, continuing to engage in education. So doing uh, motivational speaking uh, and doing one-on-ones with young people who are wanting to make a living out of being an artist as I have uh, for many, many, many years uh, and continue to do. Uh, and also facilitating uh, conversations around race, but also conversations around uh, arts and arts integration. Kiana, you here? Sorry. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for participating in the panel. It was very successful. This is, it's a wrap, guys. All right. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you so much. And by the way, I just want to say I'm honored to be on a panel with you guys. I'm honored to be with everyone. Thank you. Thank um, you.
I, I challenge us to uh, talk again. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Right. I'm ready. Okay. Right. Thank All you. Right. I'll be Bye -bye. glad. Take care. Peace out, everybody. All right. Hello, hello. Well, welcome. <laughs> well, I'm going to begin to um, thank you all for tuning in to this particular panel discussion. This panel discussion is with uh, Marcus Johnson. He's the acclaimed jazz pianist, and we're going to be able to discuss his book, his audio book, For the Love Of. Now, Marcus Johnson is an independent Billboard ranked musician, NAACP Image Award nominee, owner of Flow Brands and Flow Wine, JD and MBA, philanthropist, father, friend, and so much more. You heard me say Flow. Flow is for the love of. It's a brand that represents the journey through which we discover those things of life that fulfill us and make us each experience a little better for the love of life, for the love of self, for the love of happiness, passion, joy, and for love itself. Uh, the subtitle of this book is Living the Journey of Life with Intention, Love, Passion, and Happiness. Welcome, Marcus Johnson. Hello, how are you doing? All right, all right. So uh -huh. glad to have you here. It's my pleasure, absolutely. Well, you know, uh, Marcus, we've we've been chatting you know for a while and one of the things that i i've always known about you is that you've always found time to share insights that you've garnered through your experience to whomever will take the time to listen you've done ted talks you've done business programs you've done trainings and you know folks always see artists and they think they're they're an entertainment and entertainment is really a tough business if you're really treating it as a business, but I want you to give our listening, our, our viewing and listening audience an opportunity to just know a little bit about your background, your background that brings you to this place and that, that really makes you all of who you are. Uh, you know, my background is from Washington, D.C. Um, basically my entire life. I've gone out and come back many times um, from elementary school and high school. I graduated from Blair High School <clears throat> and then went on to the University of Miami, but due to family issues and my mom getting very ill, I ended up having to come back to D.C. And um, I say ended up having, I really enjoyed my time in Miami, but I also had a very good experience um, with the people that I met and, and, you know, studied with at Howard University, where I got my undergraduate degree. And um, while I was there, I was able to get a demo deal with Blue Note Records and um, you know, out of the experiences with that, decided that I was going to go ahead and go to law school and uh, entered into Georgetown Law and their MBA, JD MBA program, which is the Masters of Business Administration. And um, to, what was that? God, 19, 2000, whatever, uh, 1993. And, um, you know, put out a couple of CDs while I was there, started touring 20 CDs later, a wine brand later. Um, you know, being a dad later, um, you know, getting uh, married and being divorced later, um, being a big brother, big cousin, um, and someone in the community who is willing to share these experiences. Um, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's 
it's really the experience. I mean, I'm just, I'm happy to be able to be in a place where I'm vulnerable enough to share my experiences, which include, you know, the heartbreak, um, the failures and the learning lessons that most aren't willing to share. And most try to make you think that you're less than when you have them. And absolutely it is an imperative part of your journey. So uh, that's where, you know, the book came from and the TED Talks and teaching at Howard University and Georgetown and Cornell and Linfield College or University now. Um, it's just a, a willingness to, you know, understand that I'm part of a bigger puzzle and I'm willing to uh, be my piece and do what I can to amplify those others. Well, amplify you certainly do. You have this book, I believe it came out, was it 2016? 2017. 2017. And, <clears throat> and, and now you have moved to this century into this COVID time and you've made it available. It became available on audio. Audio, is it with Audible? Audible and with uh, iTunes, yes. Okay, so t tell us about that whole evolution because that's a, that too is a process of a, a shift and a transition. And right now, I bet you'll have far more people who will listen to it today than would have listened to it in 2017. I mean, absolutely. I was kind of an early adopter in that I had a smaller publishing company. And when I negotiated the deal in 2016, 2017, my initial thoughts were to have an audiobook copy. Um, the issue is, is like, you know, they pay for the uh, pay for the studio time, and then you're stuck with, you know, giving somebody your royalties, where if you just take your time, you figure that Audible or Amazon or iTunes will come up with a way for you to upload the product yourself. And with people at home, um, in their cars more, more people I see listening with their earbuds on um, bicycles, uh, on their walks. This is, this is what I do. I mean, you know, the, the, the idea that we're musicians and we're in the music industry is a farce. We're actually therapists. So where's the best place to listen to your therapy book? You know, when isn't there a good time for you to listen to that, right? So um, to be able to get in my studio, which... When I was in, a, in an apartment a few, what, last year, um, was basically it was my closet, my daughter's closet. <laughs> you know, I set up a studio in there. It was great. The Sonics were great because our clothing were in there. And I just recorded away. And uh, then I had to edit. And with the new ACX platform, you're able to actually, um, uh, you're actually able to launch your own book. So, I mean, I, I I've watched technology and it's a great time to be a grinder and an entrepreneur in, you know, whether you're a thought leader, whether you're a thought leader in music, um, in any field, it's just great because you can distribute your stuff everywhere. You, you want to know what, want to know what's interesting is that when I had you on the thought and business hour and oh, many years ago, I had this advanced piece of technology. I had this, Zoom mic. You know, people are just getting a Zoom. That was a Zoom mic then, right? Yes. And we recorded everything. I said, well, you know, Marcus, I don't know if I can upload the show because uh, I don't know how to transfer it. You said, well, you just go to just go to YouTube and you'll be just fine. But not only did you tell me that, I said, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I went home. I looked. I didn't know what I was doing. And then you searched it, found it, and sent it to me. You know, that just was the extra, extra step. So, one of the things that we've noticed during these sessions today is that many people would like to know about this technology. I mean, ever since I learned how to do that, I've been going to YouTube. YouTube is my best friend. And, so, and, that, and you talk about the stats that it gives you and everything like that. You just mentioned a piece of technology that you use with ACS. If uh, you a -A -A found, ACX. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that because people are really interested in technology up in the chat. So you have two platforms um, when you are working with, uh, when you're working with Audible and or in Amazon and Kindle. So ACX is the, um, the Amazon something exchange. Uh, I'm looking it up as we're talking right now. I'll look it up. You keep going. <laughs> yeah. So basically it gives you the online, it, it gives you the step-by-step -step process of um, uploading your audiobook to, so that it will be on Audible, on iTunes, um, and Audible, Amazon, and iTunes. And then it's paired with, um, there's the Amazon, um, 
I, and, and again, it's off the top of my head, PD. Okay. There's a there's the 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 platform that allows you to put your book on Kindle, mm-hmm. and you know again those two work together because you it was very interesting to me that you couldn't just put up um, a uh, you couldn't just put up an audiobook, and you had to actually put up a it's KDP dot Amazon dot com, and um, that's for the self publishing and you needed both in order to get your book up because. You know, with the promo codes that they're using and actually meant to help our authors promote their books, of course, somebody took advantage of it and started trying to make money off of it. So now you have to have your written form and your audio form so that they know that it is an actual book. Um, But they give you, uh, much like Spotify for Artists does right now, it gives you the engineers that you can use to help you with your stuff. Um, they give you the, they get authors that will help you or writers that will help you finish your concept. Um, because they understand that in order for their platform to grow, they need to seed into the authors themselves. So you have to do the research, but like at the end of the day, it is one of those things where we live in a time where, you know, whether or not you have the talent, you can, you're an email or a video or a call away from somebody that can help make your product look, sound, feel um, as professional as you want to. Now, did you have to have the ISBN number um, for your original book to be able to publish with the ACX platform? Before you, 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 you answer that question, I did pull up about ACX and it, it actually indicates that it's a marketplace where authors, literary agents, publishers, and other rights holders can connect with narrators, engineers, recording studios, and other producers capable of producing and finishing an audiobook. The result, as you say, more audiobooks will be made. And I know when I researched on Amazon before, um, there was a large ratio where you, you received 70% of the money when you uh, did a Kindle book. Mm-hmm. As opposed to when you're an author, you usually start on the opposite end of the spectrum of 10 to 30 percent. So um, I'll let you proceed with what your what your answer was. You were about to say something. No, I mean, I was just going to say that, it, you know, we're at a time where it's possible to find the right producers, engineers, et cetera, to help you get your product out, even if you just have an idea. Um, and this is something with COVID that has pushed a lot of people, well, has pushed the right people who are actually engaged, who are, who are looking for these things and researching. Um, it, it actually allows them, you know, I can't sing or my voice is not the right one for my book, but let me look down this list of people and get some samples of my book and then hire one to do it. And, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, and I would say fortunately, you have to invest in yourself and your money um, as it relates to the sound and the professionalism of your, your product. And, you know, you have to invest the time to research this stuff. And I, I often hear between musicians and, you know, authors and artists, you know, it's just like, well, I don't have time for that. I have to create. And my simple question back to them is, how's that working for you? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I remembered my question. It wasn't you. Uh, the question was, did you have to have the ISBN number for your book in order to produce the audio book? Did you no, have to- they, it's, it's just like a CD baby format for music. They will provide you with an ISBN number. So mm-hmm. I, did not, I did not need my original ISBN number. Okay, folks. So you're getting in on the front end of the uh, spectrum. I know when I attended a self-publishing uh, piece before, when, when we publish regular books, you used to have to pay $75 for any increment of 10 of ISBN numbers. Mm-hmm. Now you pay something like $275 for each one. If you're going through CD Baby right now, people can get your ISBN number. I mean, publish your book without going through trouble. As this morphs and more mm-hmm. people come on, the restrictions will become greater. So I say publish now. And getting right back to your book, though, it leads with uh, Sheila Johnson, who's done the forward for your book. And I I don't want to miss the opportunity for you to share uh, the sentiment, the intention and what people will derive from just uh, just just listening to your book. 
You know, it's kind of interesting because I defaulted. I was sending it to somebody who was asking for it today, and I defaulted back to my chapter on, uh, or I hit a button, and it defaulted back to a chapter, uh, the chapter on crime, for the love of crime. And what I hope is that out of reading the book and every chapter and every word that you just really understand that you're not alone. Um, and you're not alone in your anxiety. <clears throat> you're not alone in your feelings of inadequacy. You're not alone in your feelings of uh, uh, fear. You're not alone in your, your feelings of questioning your faith. You're not alone and you know having colossal failures not a, alone and this is like in different parts of your life so you know there's for the love of relationships and understanding to me that if you can narrow it down to three things it's aligned values consideration and and communication and that's whether it's business or whether it's a personal relationship and you know these are things where i'm hoping that people actually you know um it's the thing where I hope that people actually use it as a reference tool and not just, I'm going to read this and it's done. It's something that you can go back to right in the margins and say like, okay, I did this. Let me try this again. And then next year you go back and read it and you have a whole new set of, you know, issues, or maybe you need help with for the love of focus. Um, you may need something that deals with for the love of purpose or, you know, you're not the only one out there that really needs to forgive yourself for the things that you do. Um, and, and the love of forgiveness and failing, you know, that is uh, that is one of the chapters that I was also in today, where it's like most of us are so hard on other people because we're really beating ourselves up. At people. And if you could just sit and look in the mirror and be like, look, man, I forgive you, you know, hey, lady, I forgive you. Um, it would make your experience, your life experience that much better. Well, I took the time to pull out my review of your book. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I had to reach over for, folks, because I, I, I thought that, you know, Marcus is just so humble. He's not going to, you know, really glorify himself like, like he should. So I, I'm going to say what happened after I read the book. Make sure you set aside a block of time when you start listening to this book, because it will be hard to hit the pause button. Once I started listening, I had to force myself to go to sleep. Here are some of my takeaways. I'm pumped up, not giving up on myself. I have some new tools to use to help me stay on track. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to set some high arching goals. I have faith to know that all is possible. Thank you so much because that's where I was when I finished listening to your book. Uh, and thank you. I mean, I appreciate the review and, you know, taking the time. And, you know, we're at a point in this world where we're always at the point where you need more vulnerability um, and acceptance of yourself and others and how they feel. The hard part is, you know, accepting others when they're different, you know, mm -hmm. and um, yes. it, we're, we're really seeing that in politics right now and how they, you know, but it, there is a midpoint where you can say, I can accept you for who you are and let's figure out a way forward, you know, um, be you a Republican or a Democrat. What, you know, here are the things that you're fearing. Can you, can you accept who I am, you know, and choose not to have fear around those issues? I mean, it's very important in politics right now because every word that's coming out of most people can say every. Many of the words that we're hearing are all about negativity. They're all about things that, you know, um, that, that aren't for the positive, they, that, that aren't growing, that aren't creating. It's all about divisive, um, divisive attitudes, divisive and selfish um, and fearful types of, you know, vibes that are, it's a shame. Well, um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give a little tease. We had an hour to talk about it on the show, so uh, we were able to take deep, deep dives. But we talked about uh, two of the theories, two of the acronyms that you have. And in this book, you had an acronym that said DREAM. Uh, I mean, DEPEL, which was DREAM, Environment, Plan, Execute, Listen, and Learn. And while we were on the line, you said, oh, no, I, 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 have, a, I have a different one. We went from DEPEL to DEEPER. Mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about those two 
whole acronyms and what goes along with that. And that will give people a little tease so they can go get the book. You know, I believe that if you have a passion and a life model that there is that the world is yours, you can do anything. And you see the people who are successful and they have a way that they do something over and over and over because our lives are about cycles. Um, you know, some people look at it linearly and like, well, if I use up all of this, then when I get here, you know, I'll just get another one of these, whether it's a car, whether it's, you know, a significant other, whether it's a political party. But the idea really is that life really functions on a circle, hopefully going this way. And that you have, you know, cycles within everything you do, be it spirituality, relationships, politics, community, family, self, etc. So the life model that we, you know, have created is, you know, it started with the PAL, dream, environment, plan, execute, listen, learn. But after, you know, doing some, uh, doing a workshop with my uh, older sister, who's a consultant as well, you know, we came up with Deeper. And Deeper is, you know, significant and, you know, it's the right word because that is what each of us needs to do. We need to make sure that D, that we have a dream that is ours and wholly ours and not mom's, dad, sister, brother, significant other, et cetera. This is our dream, how we see ourselves. Two, you have to be engaged in that dream, which is the first E. Engagement is absolutely, you know, it's imperative. Are you researching on your dream? Are you, you know, are you clear with, you know, your purpose of your dream? Because if not, as Napoleon Hill says in, in uh, Outwitting the Devil, you know, the devil will get you and take control of you if you are drifting. The only way not to drift is to make sure that you have a definite purpose. The second E is environment. And this is one, particularly, well, I won't even say in the African-American community, I'll say in, in, in like environment. Um, environment is a whole idea where you have a person who is um, getting advice from the wrong person. They're seeking advice from you know their, their friend, relationship advice from their friend that doesn't have a relationship. You know, um, they, they are looking for business advice from somebody who's never had a business. Uh, they are looking for medical advice from somebody that's not a doctor. And you see this, you know, again and again in our society and, you know, your environment is, is important and you need to eradicate negative people, places, things, and ideas. And you need to promote positive people, places, things, and ideas as much as possible. Because if you plant a seed in fertile ground, it absolutely will grow if you continue to follow the cycle. The P and deeper is a plan. And most of us, um, again, we're not taught about planning. We're taught, go do it. I mean, well, if, you know, if you just jump out and jump off the cliff and, you know, the, it's a really high cliff in shallow water, you're going to die. You know, you're going to have a challenge. You're going to have an issue. The idea is setting out on a plan of how you're going to achieve this dream. And that really comp is comprised of like looking at your resources, you know, what you have that you can use, uh, capabilities, the skills that you possess, the people that you have around you. And also something that's very important, which is the idea of what are you willing to give up in order to get, you know, where you want to go. There are a lot of people that want to fly, but they don't want to let go of the baggage that's been holding them down on the runway. A plane can't fly if it's too heavy and neither can we. So as it relates to flying and getting deep, dream, dream engaged environment plan, that's great, but we have to go deeper. Execute. A lot of people write, I have a plan. I'm going to get to it. You got to do it. And how do you do it? Any legal way possible. And finally, you know, and I can go deeper into any of these. Reflection. And people, because of our ego, and I believe that there are two people that live within our bodies, right? I believe there is I, which is the one that is connected to I am. And I believe there is me. What about me? <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's the one that tells you all the crazy stories in your head. The only way to make sure that you are dealing with I is to take a step back, get quiet and get and reflect so that you can go back to your plan because it's not me's plan, right? This is I's plan. It is the mini I of I am the mini creator in Genesis made in the likeness of, right? So you have to go back, leave me, and try to eradicate me. 
I know me is here, or me is here, or me is here, or me's in my tummy, telling me, you ain't, you know what? You can't do that. What, what is so-and-so saying? Why are they doing that? You need to do this. And I is like, but I just want to be successful and change the world. Listen to I and protect I diligently as much as you can every single day. You can only do that when you reflect. When you look at your past experience and also say, okay, this didn't work because my ego got in the way. I forgive myself for having an ego because that makes me human. So what I'm going to do then now is then go back. How do I refine the dream to get it even closer? And then stay engaged, refine my environment. How can I get me and all the other me stuff, uh, everybody else's ego out of my life? Plan, execute, reflect. And if you do that and look at that, along with, you know, the most important, you know, I, I think resource that you have, which is your calendar, because your calendar tells you what you really value right now. It, it is your receipt of your time, the most valuable resource you have. Looking at your calendar over the past three weeks to say, yeah, maybe I didn't do this the right way. If you want to be successful in business, how many business books did you read? Did you get ink? Did you get entrepreneurship? Did you get on, uh, on YouTube and just put in, I don't know anything about business, help. Did you go to, you know, Reddit? You know, people use Reddit and all these other places to complain about people, complain about relationship, complain about politics, use it proactively. Once you get past that reflective phase and then get ready to reset and relaunch, it goes in the cycle, everything you do, and you can't help but be successful. Well, that's a perfect place to to kind of wrap up. Uh, okay. You know, we, we said that when, when we got talking, by the time we got revved up, it would be time to go, and it, it certainly is. But uh, before you introduce the piece that's uh, coming up, I want to give you an opportunity to say perhaps um, what is the most important thing that you share in your book or that you've experienced that you think will help those who are listening and viewing you right now? And that's a little one minute cap for you and then we'll come back again. I wanna give you that opportunity. I may not have asked you that one question, go ahead. There, you know, I was listening to the book since it's been up on Audible and I've noticed there are a couple of times when I'm like, you know, going in the gym, are you scared? Are you afraid of what people are going to say? Um, you know, are you conscientious of how you look? Um, and I think that the gym is the, the perfect metaphor for life and how people like, I, I can't be an entrepreneur or I can't be a successful artist or I can't be a great teacher or I can't be a great doctor. I'm not a good dad or a good mom. And just understand, acknowledge that. Okay, yeah, I'm scared. What is this really? I'm scared. I have fear and I'm supposed to be faithful. So I'm going to act like I'm faithful. Wait, no, if God doesn't say that. If God just says, just focus on creating. I'll take care of the last. Which means that you're human. You are a human being. Be human. Be human to yourself and be humane to yourself. Treat yourself like you would your best friend or somebody that you love. So when you do that, and you recognize that that's part of humanity with a model, that's what this book is about. You know, uh, where can they find it? Audible.com, iTunes, uh, and Amazon. It's Marcus Johnson, F-L-O, uh, Living the Journey of Life with Intention, Love, Passion, and Happiness, forward by Sheila Johnson. And, um, you know, look out for Deeper coming soon. <laughs> yeah, Deeper is going to be coming soon. You know, Marcus Johnson, you know, you, you've been so familiar, you've been so kind and generous with your time. I certainly want to personally thank you. Thank you for lending your support and your hand, your name, your talent to this, our, our first virtual uh, Gateway Open Studios tour. And thank you for all you do in the community. You continue to try and share the wealth of what you've gained and what you've learned with the general, the community at large, and I thank you for doing so, and I just thank you for being you. We really appreciate you, okay? It's my honor, and thank you for the opportunity to share it. Certainly, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to um, queue up the piece we have, because you were also kind enough to lend us a live performance for the audience to see 
uh, something else of what you really do so well. So you'll cue it up and we'll go from there. Thanks so much. This is a COVID session from Blue House Productions in Silver Spring. I've been doing a lot of these. Uh, Danny song and um, and a new one that's coming out called The Missing Ingredients. And uh, I'm, I'm just having fun, man. I'm back to practicing my Bach. I'm back to practicing my Chopin. And I'm back to practicing and just being me. So I hope you enjoy this with Chuchu Caldwell and Chris Biscuit Bynum. And you can find all my music on Spotify, follow my Pandora station, uh, and anywhere you can get anybody else's music, you can get uh, the Marcus Johnson sound. So use it, enjoy it. Also with that glass of low wine. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. likely suspects, you know, in the most positive of ways, um, my creators in positivity and great music. On bass, we have Mr. Anthony Chuki Caldwell, otherwise known as just Chuki. And then on drums, we have our music director, great guy, fellow, we're all fellow dads, by the way. And um, we were just talking about homeschooling, though, because <laughs> our kids are still young enough where we have to Zoom homeschool um, during this crazy time. And that's Chris Biscuit Bynum on drums. So we're going to start this one off with one of our faves. This is called Danny Song.
next tune that we're going to play, and trust me, we're having fun with this, is called The Missing Ingredient. Something brand new for you. <laughs> So put that. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Just Rock. Thank you, Open Tour, Open Studio Tour, for having me today. My name is Sam Hudson, and I'm here at the Just Rock Studio in Brentwood, Maryland. And I'm very excited today to start off with a couple of uh, clarinet pieces that I have. For those of you who don't know, Just Rock is. For those of you who don't know, 
uh, Just Rock is a uh, music studio out here where we host music instrument lessons for all ages and all instruments. We have open rehearsal space. Uh, we have weekly performances and many events here, including open mic and Just Rock Unplugged for those musicians who are looking for a space to perform in in the DMV area. Okay, without further ado, here we go. This is a piece that I played a while ago. It's called Dancing Solo. I'm just a solo clarinet piece, so feel free to move around with around you. And it's by a composer named Libby Larson. This is Dancing Solo. <laughs> guitar now do a little bit of guitar playing okay. all right so this is an original that i uh wrote a little while ago i'm with a, a band now called gray wolf one of my friends freddie he's not here with me today but that's okay we're going to do a solo style of a very simple uh little piece and it's called morning whiskey Way too late. Made breakfast. 
wish but you left me wanting and up to date in 10 before 8 it's my bucks before they close i want to be morning whiskey a cup of coffee in the second inning the way that you smile when you're in your setting a party of yours from 1960 i want to be morning whiskey Cup of coffee in the second inning, the way that you smile when you're at your favorite Once again, uh, this one's an oldie. Um, I think the song was written in like late, uh, early 1960s. Um, and it's called The Baseball Blues. It's by a woman named Camille Harris, and it's a Dixieland band piece. So I'm going to play a little bit of the clarinet stuff. <laughs> This one is a song, it's another original, uh, Grey Wolf original. I wrote this one a while ago. Let's see, I'm not my pick right here. Uh -huh. And it's called Believe. And this is an original that I wrote quite some time ago. Here we go. I chose to believe in you. 
to keep myself away To open up my eyes and see That you are not there for me I keep my feelings the best Cause I know That you won't listen to me There's gotta be some other way we can go So I can sound relief I keep my feelings suppressed Cause I know That you won't listen to me There's gotta be some other way we can go So I can sound relief so much everyone thank you open studio tour once again for having me thank you just rock of course for um introducing me and and letting me be on today's webinar i appreciate it and remember to come for music lessons of course thank you very much everyone just rock studios brentwood maryland Hello, everyone. We'd like to thank you all for um, listening and saying in. We're going to start with a brief information. Thank you.
welcome to a new nail and spa in uh, 3215 Long Island, Maryland. I am a Katrina. Um, we ready for open the salon uh, for safety or custom. Can you contact with uh, my phone number 301-887-1386. Thank you. I would like to invite you on a video journey of my new work. For most of my life, clay was my preferred medium. But starting in 2018, I started playing with ABS plastic and a variety of other media. And so here is a closer look.
I appreciate being here. My name is Hedda Rose. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Yes, yes. Um, I have a Caribbean background. My family's Caribbean. And um, I love to sing. I love to write. I love to draw. I love to paint. I love to film. I love to photograph. And in Jamaican culture, we're known for having at least 10 jobs. So I'm considered lazy. <laughs> My name is Shaka King, and I'm a fashion designer who specializes in menswear. My aesthetic as a designer is an American feel with a European edge, so therefore I have clothing that I create. Based because I'm American, it has that American feel, but because I love Europe and have lived there for a while, it has nuances and detailing that are not typical, what you would say, American fair. When it comes to design, I usually pick fabric first, and then I can create. And that's usually most of the time because I'm really drawn to fabrics, textures, and color, and the feel of it. Once I feel it in my mind, I can see things. Okay. Well, the design Willie Smith, Scott Barry, and Stephen Burroughs were on the cover, and they were all African American. And then that's when I said, that's what I am. I'm a fashion designer. And it felt right, and that's what it became. Whenever they're trying to, you know, be fly, let me cop some Shocker King menswear. It's a feeling.
Daryl Hunt, and this is Silver Logan Sharp. We're the co-creators of Feel Better Friday. Yep, and we filmed Feel Better Friday right here in the Mount Rainier Artist Lofts. Yes, this is where we create, this is where we record, this is where we make music. Mm-hmm, right here in the Mount Rainier Artist, Artist Lofts. Lofts. Right now it's Silver Logan Sharp, and you know what? It's feel better, feel better. Hey, feel better Friday. Hi everybody, I'm Sharon Robinson. I am an artist, mixed media and collage artist in the Artist by the Tracks complex at Otis Street. And I'd like to welcome you to my studio. I'm gonna do a quick demo here, something that I'll be doing where we able to meet in person. Um, I always like to do live activities when we have open studios. Um, I just really enjoy engaging everyone that comes through the studio. So I'm just going to show you something that would be typical of what I would do in that circumstance where we're able to 
meet in person. And I'm going to change my view here and show you some examples. This is a piece that was done with this monoprint technique that I'm going to show you. This is a little bit more complex. It is a little bit of collage, but primarily printmaking. Here is a second smaller piece. This is on watercolor paper again, a little bit of collage. And a few just raw prints. So the wonderful thing about these is that they're very adaptable for all kinds of uses. If you're into card making or you want backgrounds for collage or component pieces for collage, there's so many things that you can do with them. Um, so I also have um, a bunch of materials that are just household materials. This is the end of a thread spool and some packing materials these sorts of things that you can find around the house. And the printmaking is done with a jelly plate. This is a homemade plate and it was made with unflavored gelatin and glycerin. So this is actually permanent. I made this about a year ago. Very easily done in your own refrigerator at home. This is one that I purchased online. So these are very readily available and come in many different sizes. Okay, so for this we're going to use some pretty basic acrylic paints, nothing fancy. And I'm going to do both of these at the same time. Squirt a little bit on each one. And I'm going to use a brayer. This is actually a tool generally used for printmaking. And I have an assortment of papers. So I have coffee filters, which are great for the round one in particular, watercolor paper, rice paper, and some sheet music. I'm going to start with the watercolor paper. So I'm just rolling out all of my acrylic ink from my plates. And I'm going to use some of my packing material to make a pattern. These are little stencils. And I also like using stamps for types. Lay my paper on here carefully, just rub it really hard all over. And lift. Have these really interesting prints. So another great, really good thing about these is they can be printed over, so you can do this multiple times if you don't like what it looks like on the first go around. Also going to do this round one here. And the other thing about the homemade jelly plates is that they can be any size or shape. I did this one in a Pyrex dish. There we go. So 
So one of the things I love about papers like this, especially certain types of found papers, is that when these are layered in a collage, they become somewhat translucent. So they're really great for putting a, a number of things together. And we'll see if we can get a ghost print off of here. There's a little bit more paint on there, yes. Here we have a print on sheet music. So this is a great activity to do with kids. Um, change my view here again. Really easy to do with kids. It's um, easy because you don't need anything complicated. These aren't expensive paints. These are, you know, very affordable uh, brands of paint. I have some that I've gotten at Target too. These are like a couple of bucks, come in really good colors. And um, this is a class I actually teach uh, on a regular basis. I have a new class that will be starting with the Smithsonian on September 9th, a three session class on monoprint without a press. And that will be repeated hopefully uh, at the end of September at the Montpelier Arts Center along with some other classes. So I teach regularly at the Smithsonian and at Montpelier. And I also do private classes in my studio. So come visit me. Um, my website is therobinsonstudio.com. And it's also the Robinson Studio on Instagram and Facebook. So thank you all for visiting and hope to see you when we have a real live open studios event again, hopefully. <laughs>
So I'm working on that aspect right now since I just got back. And I like things that bend and fold and be turned around and it goes inside and outside. The end. <laughs> I'm Cece Cole McInturf. I'm a sculptor. I'm part of the Otis Street Arts Project. Welcome to the studio. I use a variety of materials. I'm drawn to metal and wood. And I love making paper, both thin, vulnerable, kind of irregularly shaped pieces as well as much larger. What's really going on in my studio and in my head are materials that for me make emotional metaphors. So for the last few years, I've worked in organic ephemera, plant and animal material. Work not designed to be preserved or archival per se, though they show beautifully indoors, um, but it's work allowed to wear away over time back to where it came from. So everything uh, from flax, sycamore, ebony, mesquite, Palm husks, horsehair, skins, wings, stones, sea vines. Uh, these materials are humbling and instructive. I'm sort of obsessed with sharing them. It's uh, work that's more useful experientially. I mean, it's intimate. It can resonate. It can convey a sense of wisdom from things no longer living. Things you may sense you have something in common with. You know, uh, what's considered beautiful. The wonder, distinct from resistance, the wonder about decomposition and death, uh, the critical nature of adapting or regeneration, uh, of course the inevitable truth of our interbeing with all other life and the peril of our ignoring that. And these materials at times uh, too really suggest a sense of hope about that. I really look forward to the day when you can come in person to the studio, hold this work, touch these materials, see if they rearrange you at all. But for now, I leave you with more looks around the studio walls and what's getting made there, and some words on what is really at the heart of it. Wabi Sabi at the very least, a particular kind of beauty. Historically of China and Japan, it's impacted and inspired my work and materials the last several years. This beauty of wabi-sabi isn't to everyone's liking, but wabi-sabi can, in its fullest expression, be a way of life, a view of life. Wabi-sabi's spirit says truth comes from observing nature. Greatness exists in inconspicuous and overlooked details or moments. Beauty can be coaxed out of ugliness. A wabi-sabi mindset accepts the inevitable, appreciates a cosmic order of things, gets rid of all that's unnecessary, focuses on the intrinsic. It suggests, if not celebrates, natural process and the fundamental uncontrollability of nature. It is intimate, irregular, unpretentious, earthy. The basis of a new or an additional pure beauty. It implies an intuitive view of things. It says there's a value in an intuitive view of things. These items you're seeing are one of a kind, no multiples or additions, ostensibly crude. 
heavily calling. Hello and welcome to Otis Street, Ovens. It suggests, in this work as in life, to be comfortable remaining alone with ambiguity or contradiction or some aspects that are less clear, dark, dim. For there might be something of potential or wise or sacred. Hello and welcome to Otis Street Oban Studios. My name is Kirsty Little and I'm a sculptor. So during this, uh, this dreadful period, I know we've all been spending hours on Zoom, so I started to fiddle around with polymer clay while I was on Zoom, making these totally obscure little creatures and characters which surged out of my subconsciousness during the hours of international catch up and work that I was doing. And I do recommend for those of you who spend hours on Zoom, just grab a packet of polymer clay and fiddle into something. You can stick it in the oven and it's cooked in 15 minutes. So I thought I'd show you some of my uh, fine sculpture that I've now been working on since um, I found out that my show got confirmed at the Onfleur Gallery in Anacostia in September. So let me take you and show you what I'm working The theme of my show is hope. And here I have a set of sheep's antlers that I've um, adulterated with polymer clay wire and steel wire that I've painted. And it doesn't have a title at present, this piece. Further down my table, I have a wood and wire piece called a safe. And this is um, a piece of pecan wood at the bottom there with these steel wires inserted through and each end is dipped in wax. And in the very centre there, there's copper wires with orange tips. And as you can see, you peer through the centre to see that little inside section safely nestled amongst the forest outside. Over here is another wire piece. This is the start of a larger installation where there'll be lots of these little sections. Again, it's steel wire with wax tips wrapped with aluminium bags. Here I am at my friend Bob's house using his garage here. Um, to do some drill pressing because he has these fantastic tools that he's super kind enough to let me use um, and I'm presently drilling a million little holes into this long stretch of wood for my next piece for my hope series. This is the finished piece of wood I was working on in the last clip um, with all of its corresponding silver wires to go in it. It's probably going to be a sister piece to the piece you saw on the table earlier but this one will be in this plane hanging on the wall. Come back to see the finished stairs where I have another workstation for porcelain. I'm making an installation. Here's various little pods, fashionable word, um, that are drying out, created with the use of balloons. These are some accessories for them. And over here, we have the beginning idea of what the installation might look like. That's again a piece of pecan wood um, given to me by a friend who has a pecan farm. And all of these little clay pieces are individual. Some of them will be hanging from the wall above and below. Made out of porcelain. This piece is called fruition. The beginning and growth of something new. Hopefully a new and improved world compared to the one that we're in right now. Exploring my artwork with me. Um, if you'd like to contact me for any information, prices, etc., please uh, go through the website shown on the screen below.
I look forward to seeing you in person as soon as this situation is over. Hi, I'm Lisa Rosenstein. Welcome to my studio. I have been home for about three months due to COVID, as like most of us. And uh, anyway, I'm back and I'm so thankful to be back. Uh, while I was home, I did a series of vessels made out of newspaper and water. I finally found a way to deal with my feelings about what was going on. So I made a series of vessels probably got about 50, 60, maybe more of them. Um, I did use some older paper that I had had put away because I think a lot of what the newspaper is about is memory um, and history. And a lot of times we forget what's come before and we become overwhelmed and we don't know how to deal with it. This vessel here, I think, is pretty meaningful because it's William Christenberry, who was a teacher of mine at the Corcoran. And if anybody knows who William Christenberry is, he documented a lot of the, of the South and racism and the Ku Klux Klan. And so he was an artist historian, in, in, my, in my humble opinion. He was also a man who had Alzheimer's, and because of that, he lost his memory. But I haven't forgotten him, and I think his art is still very important, and his memory is important. Let me take you on a walk around my studio. <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> of course that's going to happen. <laughs> Deconstruction, reconstruction, and you know, trying to make some sense out of this crazy world. So um, that's what I've been doing, and I've got a lot of plastic. <laughs> Lisa Rosenstein from Otis Street Arts Project in Mount Rainier. I uh, hope everybody's doing okay, and uh, you know, I hope someday we can all see each other in person. Mwah.
drive, drop that beat. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? How you doing? How's it going? This has been wonderful, even virtual, seeing all the beautiful people and artists of Mount Rainier. Shout out to Mount Rainier! <laughs> what's happening, everybody? I'm Silver Logan Sharp, and this is the maestro, Daryl L.A. Hunt. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? Somebody, you know, give me a signal, a smoke signal, something. Let me know it's all good. Shall we move forward? Shall we do it? All good. Okay, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, shout out to everybody who's uh, joined, who's watching, who'll watch later, who, you know, and all that good stuff. Um, we've got a couple of songs for you. We are uh, artists, musicians. He's a producer and and music director to the stars. I'm an artist and songwriter and producer as well, and a jewelry designer. Come on, jewelry. <laughs> and we film a show here called Feel Better Friday. We've been doing it. Let's see, we're headed into season four. And we've been filming here. Uh, we've had everybody from Najee to uh, Mesa to Gene Karn and many, many others. And uh, we'll be back at it on September 25th. So make sure you check it out every Friday at one o'clock on Facebook Live and our YouTube channel. So this, thank you, Tia. Thank you for having us. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, shout out to all the artists that are doing their thing. So we're going to do a little song for you. This is from our Groovement CD. Now, you know this song. You've heard this one before. This is our little spin. Now, just imagine if right now, if right now, which we do have the power. You gotta use your voice so you know where I'm going with this, right? But just imagine how much you could change the world, literally, with your art, with your spirit, with your creativity, with your painting, with all that plastic and fabric, <laughs> and with some good old music right here from the Mount Rainier Artist Laws. Come on, hey, yeah. Now, I, I can't see you, and I can't hear you, but put your hands together. Come on. You can get up and dance while nobody's watching. Come on. <laughs> this is Change the World. Yeah. If I can reach the star, I'd pull one down for you. I'd shine it on my heart. So you can see the truth That this love I have inside Yeah, it's everything it seems But for now I find Only in my dreams I could change the world I could be in the sunlight in your universe you would think my love is really something good, baby. I could change, change the world. Yeah. If I could be your queen, even more. 
This kingdom we have made Till then I'll be the fool Wishing for that day Oh, if I could change the world I'd be the sunlight in your universe You would think my love is really something good for one more all good or is it you know huh what's up somebody give me a signal y'all want one more i can't really see we're gonna do something for you like this hopefully we're still we still got some time i hope you're enjoying it again shout out to tia kane shout out to miss tony thank y'all for including us on this check it out This one we wrote is on our first album. It's called Don't Give Up On You. Uh. Imagine the world that no one had covered for skin. Imagine the place where everyone only stands to win. Some of us call our world a peaceful place. If you could go back, think of everything we change and go. Oh, imagine no more. You can do it. Y'all better dance. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Hey. Don't give up. <laughs> it's so easy ha, for you to jump to the wrong conclusion. I'm gonna have to add that to our show. Imagine me, you first of all, to find a resolution. See, that's pink skin and orange skin. 
Some of us think we can't change anything. But if you can do it differently, what choices would you make? inspired you in your art. I hope this song, the other song, just make the colors get more vivid. They get the poetry flowing. They get the beats coming. They get all kind of art flowing. And just let it flow all through you. Thank you so much for having us, y'all. God bless you. Peace. Thank you to everybody who put this together. God bless y'all. Thank you so much. Oh, God bless you. Let's give a round of applause for Silva, Logan, Sharp, and Daryl Hunt right now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And be sure to tune in. Tune in to Silva's program. Silva, what program is that? It's called Feel Better Friday. Feel mm -hmm. Better Friday. You can hashtag Feel Better Friday. It's Feel Better Friday on Instagram, Feel Better Friday on YouTube, Feel Better Friday, the TV show on YouTube. And you can actually catch it on DC TV and soon to be on Mount Rainier television. Very, very soon on the Mount Rainier channel. The episodes are going to air there hopefully really, really soon. Uh, but meanwhile, please, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and check us out every Friday. We film right here in the artist lofts. All kinds of artists have been here. And we're going to try to keep it going. We start the season four back up on September 25th. So it'll be virtual. You can Everybody can watch it and share it. And hopefully we can serenade you into feeling that every Friday. <laughs> Fantastic. And you bring up a good point because we actually air the Feel Better Fridays on the Gateway Artbeat app. Yes, Pierre. Thanks to Pierre Walcott of uh, Creative Edge and Samuel um, Serafile, who's producing this program right now, we've taken that opportunity to promote you. And on most Fridays, Feel Better Fridays, you can just tune into your Gateway Artbeat app and go tune into Feel Better Fridays. But you need to really subscribe to her and like her and everything because it'll help her get a channel. 
And so make sure that every opportunity that we support each other. So support Silver Logan Sharp as she has supported us. And thank you, Daryl Hunt, for bringing your piano virtuoso self here today. And I wanted to take an opportunity. We hadn't planned for this, but I got my producer to allow me to do this, to say thank you. We have credits that are going to roll in a moment, but I asked all the panelists to come back, just as you did, Silva, to say thank you for this, this effort. This has been a gargantuan effort. This is our first virtual open studio tour. It's our 16th annual open studio tour, but this is our first virtual. And I think that we can all be very proud of it. And of course, I forgot to pay the bills and to thank our sponsor. The grant that pays for this for Gateway CDC is the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. And I want to thank our grantors for giving us the funds to allow us to do this. Uh, we were joined by Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council. And we'd like to thank Rhonda Dallas for all that she's done to make this possible. You have Deep Park 3311, the Media Arts Lab. I'm going to go through our partners because it's important to say them on the air. And so we had, as I just mentioned, Deep Park 3311, the Media Arts Lab. We had Red Dirt Studio. Thank you, Margaret Boozer, for representing Red Dirt. Kate Taylor Davis from Pyramid Atlantic Arts Center. We had um, Joshua. Joshua Reynolds actually represented today for Prince George's Arts and Humanities Council. John Paradiso was representing Portico Gallery and Studios and brought his own art. I loved your video, John. Um, and then we had joining us today, David Mordini for Otis Street's Arts Project. Those pieces were just fabulous. And it was a nice opportunity to come together. And Tim Tate joined us today from the Washington Glass Studio. And I certainly thank our staff and team at Gateway. Michelle Darden Lee is the director of the Gateway Media Arts Lab. Thank you, Michelle, because you see most of these people you saw all came from the enterprise and from the Media Arts Lab. The Artist Loft is connected to the Media Arts Lab and Michelle has nurtured all these people. Michelle, wave. Michelle Darden Lee, and I thank our producers. Tia Kane came on board here and she really nailed it. Tia Kane, along with Kiana Clark, are your co-producers for this stage today. Kiana Clark, you've seen her on a few panels. Kiana, wave. Uh, Tia's online, but Tia Kane, I want to thank you for jumping in and rolling up your sleeves and staying up all night right along with me. Please don't, don't get that bad habit that I have. Um, and um, lastly, we want to thank the gentleman who's behind the stage. And that is Samuel Surafile. He's the producer of the Gateway Artbeat app. He is the person who put us on YouTube and who did all your transitions. And this being our first effort, it was a stellar job, Samuel. So Samuel Surafile, we thank you. But you know, we talk about all these people we thank. And the people I really wanted to thank were the artists. I really don't get it twisted. While I may be the executive director of Gateway CDC, I'm only the facilitator of what you do. This is our new beginning. This is our opportunity to come together and to make sure that we forge forward into this new arena, this post-COVID world, that we forge forward together in unison with open minds and hearts where we help each other, we love each other, and we lift each other up. For that, I thank the artist community and I wanted to sign off just thanking you and hoping you to have a very blessed day. And thank you for so supporting Gateway First Virtual Open Studio Tour. I want you to go to gatewayopenstudios.org and go into all of those pages and buy art from our artists. The Open Studio Tour page will be open from here on. So this is our new beginning. And I want all of you to show the love to our artists. So thank you and have a very, very blessed day. Signing off. <laughs>